Mr. Clerk, are you going to start? Um, I think with the first order of businesses, we'll, uh, we'll pass the buy-in on the agenda. I'm appointing you. So you want me to make the bylaw to appoint myself as mayor? No, I think <laughs> I can't introduce the clerk. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we do uh, have one bylaw that we're going to bring forward. First of all, it's bylaw 2018-70, and it's a bylaw to appoint Councillor Vince Cario as acting mayor in the absence of uh, Jim Diodati. I would move uh, by uh, Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All in favor? Contrary. Contrary. <laughs> so bylaw 2018-70 has been read a first time. We'll get that motion for a second and third. Second right and now. third? Yep. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angel. Perfect, thank you. All in favor? Okay, bylaw 2018 70, read a second and third time and passed. So it's official. You can, thank you. you can take uh, it might be a good time to, to say that our, our Mayor Jim is under the weather. He's been hospitalized, he's suffering from pneumonia, and we all wish him a speedy recovery. Okay, this evening we have Gina Prestia. Gina? I'm not sure if she's present yet. No? She not here yet. Not here yet? One of the counselors want to sing the national anthem. <laughs> Generally, it's the mayor. <laughs> you want to get him on the phone? <laughs> uh, then we might as well sit. Yeah, if, she she yeah. Start yeah. Meeting, if, uh, if, she's, if she shows up, we can have her. Okay. Sure. Okay. First order of business is the adoption of the minutes. Looking for a motion, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Crater, Crater, that we adopt the minutes of June the eighth. Any questions or comments on the minutes? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Do we have any disclosures of pecuniary interests? Councillor Strange. Yes, Acting uh, Mayor. Um, check number four one six two nine zero um, to myself. And item 11.10, um, bylaw extension for uh, for noise for 8th Annual Heater Zeroes Run for Children. I'm on that uh, committee that helps out. So noted. Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, Your Worship. My employer, the Niagara Catholic District School Board, has a check on there, 00160-0004. Councilor Iannone. Uh, check 416628 made out to myself. Councilor Campbell. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, I got two. A check made out to myself, uh, um, uh, 416133, and one made out to my wife, um, 416353 for uh, uh, refund services. And it, Councilor Crater. Uh, under municipal accounts, check number 416-155 uh, for services payable to myself. Any others? I'll duly note it, Mr. Clerk. Yep. Then we'll move on to number five. Uh, this was prepared uh, by the mayor. Uh, obituaries. Karen Wilvers, Courtney, mother-in-law of Jeff Anderson, a municipal works department. Brenda Fisher Hyde, daughter of former city member, city council member Shirley Fisher. Ken Boudelier, retired platoon chief and uncle of fire chief Jim Boudelier. Sheila Dietenbeck, mother of Tom Dietenbeck of fire services. Angelo Amata, father in law of Rob Vachon of our municipal works department. Reverend Duncan Lyon, gave the address, who used to give the address and prayer at the city's Remembrance Day services for many years and John Holler. We wish the families, give the families our condolences. And is there anyone else that would like to comment on any of the, uh, Councillor Thompson? Yeah, I'd just uh, like to uh, recognize Duncan Lyon, uh, 
first of all, for uh, probably 25 years did our Remembrance Day service uh, uh, without fail. Um, a great community person and uh, certainly somebody that was a great asset for the municipality. And while I'm standing, uh, just to uh, say how sad uh, it is to see John Holer, creative of uh, Marineland, uh, passing. Uh, totally a unique and different person who was totally dedicated to one uh, focus throughout his entire life and had a tremendous impact on this municipality, jobs, and uh, the tourist industry. So sad to see him gone too. Thank you. <clears throat> the Mayor Diodati wanted me to mention uh, the councillors that represented him uh, for many events. Uh, Councillor Strange, the German Village Soccer's 60th anniversary. Councillor Thompson, the grand opening of Nygaard Slims. Councillor Crater, opening ceremony of Chinese Multicultural Folk Arts Day. Councillor Peter Angelo, Canada Day Parade. Special Citizenship Ceremony, Grand Opening of Gaming Gators, the Club Italia Annual Festival. The Mayor and the City thanks you. Also, we have some announcements. And it's my pleasure to announce that the Toronto Maple Leafs will be training again in Niagara uh, in the fall of 2018. The Toronto Maple Leaf training camp will take place from September 14th to the 16th at the Gale Center. The club has previously held its 2017-2018 training camp and 2016 development camp in Niagara Falls. Fans will have the opportunity to watch the camp as the team hosts practices and scrimmages. There will also be contests, outdoor activities, and a Toronto Maple Leafs alumni game. Current Maple Leaf players and Maple Leaf alumni will also be taking part in community appearances over the weekend. Maple Leaf development staff will be on-site conducting clinics and other development-related programming for various minor hockey groups. Full details and weekend schedule will be released in the coming weeks. Fans will have the opportunity to see players such as William Nylander, Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews, and newly acquired John Tavares. Next council meeting will be Tuesday, August 14th. Next, we have deputations and presentations. Number 6.1. Um, if I could just interrupt momentarily, uh, Your Worship. Uh, we do have a deputation. Is uh, Alex uh, DeGenis and Doug Smith present? They are here. Um, if we could just get a motion of council, if we Sorry. could uh, move them have up. them moved up on the agenda or. Moved by Council Iononi, uh, second by Councilor Strange, that we listen to them first. All in favor? Um, Carried. If you want to just read, go ahead and read that blurb and then just introduce it. Alex Ditches and Doug Smith from the Wise Guys Charity would like to update council regarding their, the work their charity group is involved with. Gentlemen, I want to come up to the microphone and... Your Worship? Councillor? Well, they're coming to the microphone. Uh, uh, Alderman or Councillor Morocco asked that I let everyone know that she's absent. She's away on vacation. So noted. Gentlemen. My name is Alex DeGenis, and uh, this is my colleague and friend, uh, Mr. Doug Smith. I really appreciate the council's time and, and taking to uh, listen to a, a very brief presentation. Uh, I've watched enough of these city councils to understand that uh, a lot of times when we have speakers who have uh, uh, events, activities, festivals, uh, they come and, and pitch ideas and, and typically at the end they ask for money. Uh, we, we, on behalf of Wise Guys Charity, would like to break that tradition and uh, ask for nothing. Uh, uh, other than, so uh, yes, uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, as we're sitting around the table talking to volunteers that have been spearheading uh, this Wise Guys Charity for the last 27 years, one thing has become abundantly clear, and that is that there's a, a vast need for resources for uh, people doing good work in the community, and there is also a lack of resources and money to enable those people to do the good work that they're doing. Wise Guys Charity has got a long history of, of providing re those resources to people all over Niagara, and the one thing that's become very, very glaringly clear 
is that Niagara Falls is woefully underrepresented in the applicants that we receive. So in a nutshell, uh, this organization that is 100% uh, volunteer based, 100% of the money goes back into the community. There's nobody paid uh, that is in our organization that helps to raise this money. And there's an application process that, that Doug will talk about. I've asked Doug to just basically give a little bit of a historical context and the magnitude of what this organization has done with Niagara or to Niagara to help people in Niagara. And, uh, and as I said, we're here to basically tell you that, that, that I know that there's a need in Niagara Falls. We're just not hearing about it. So the ask, if I can cut to the chase, is for all of the influential people in this room, all of the community and civic leaders that I'm looking at and that I've, I've gotten to know over the years, if you could help spread that word to people and organizations in your community, in a very important community uh, in, in Niagara, if you can help spread that word that we exist and that we've got resources, they're just, we just need to get it to Niagara Falls, those resources to Niagara Falls, we would be grateful. I'm gonna introduce Doug to talk about Niagara, to uh, Wise Guys for a minute. Uh, I'd also like to ask uh, Council if I could just hand out just something that, that gives a little bit of an overview. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So my three-minute presentation is about 30 seconds now because of Alex's uh, details, but really uh, thank you for having us, and I just wanted to be able to give you a little bit of history and as briefly as possible, but the Wise Guys Charity Fund is a registered charity. Uh, we started about approximately 28 years ago. My dad and I started it amongst uh, and, and among numerous volunteers. And basically, as Alex said, we raise money in Niagara for Niagara. 100% of the funds raised goes back. It has to stay in Niagara. We spread it from the corners of Fort Erie and Port Colburn to Grimsby and, uh, and everywhere in between. The history of the name is, is quite simple. We started raising money for the what was then going to be built Walker YMCA many years ago and in wanting to start a golf tournament and run some events my dad and I were cloned the wise guys Y apostrophe S as we raised about 125,000 for the Y we wanted to continue our golf tournament wanted to continue to spread the wealth hence uh, needing to change the name but not good marketing people said don't change the name so that's where the WISE came from and, and the history of that's how that started about 13 years ago, we surpassed the $100,000 in funds raised in one year. In 2015, we, which was our 25th anniversary, we surpassed $250,000 raised in a year. And last year, we raised just over $350,000. Certainly, it has grown leaps and bounds. The events have grown, and the volunteer base and the committees have grown. Um, we have a signature Wise Guys Golf Tournament that actually takes place next week. Uh, 232 golfers sold out perennially with a, with a waiting list. We have a large auction night uh, the evening before. The Wise Girls are about to, uh, to tee up their fourth annual all-female golf tournament. Again, a sold out 144 female golfer event. We have a boxing night. We have a, a bike ride. We have a, an, an auction now. We have a pub night. To date, we've raised and rolled back into Niagara just over $3.1 million. It is a registered charity and there's a very formal procedure for granting out the money. So uh, organizations looking for grants apply through a grant request process. It's all available information online. Those grant requests are reviewed on an annual basis. Um, In-depth due diligence is done and the board of directors approves the grants for that year. So to give you an idea, we've written checks for as little as $500. We've written checks for as big as $100,000. Uh, this year alone, we will write 23 checks to 23 different organizations for over $350,000. And really, as Alex said, what we're looking at more than anything is to try and get Niagara Falls more involved. I think more involved in some of the events that are run and the, and the fundraising, but more importantly to us really is getting them more involved in the grant process and getting the word out. It's not that we don't get any, and then certainly they're uh, online. There's a list of all, almost all of the supported projects. You'll see there are numerous ones from Niagara Falls, but per capita, I would uh, have to say that is by far the lowest of all the cities and towns in Niagara. Thanks. Any questions of uh, Alex and Doug? Thank you.
Yes, Mr. Uh, Mike, Mike. I just want to thank Doug and Alex. From, they do incredible work around the Niagara region and known you guys for years and obviously from the, the big boxing uh, event that you put on and raised so much money. So I want to thank you and hopefully we can get the word out. Maybe we can put it, uh, their event on our uh, on our website anyways and, and try to help spread the word and, and try to get some uh, <coughs> some help for uh, for people from Niagara Falls that need it. So thank you very much. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine uh, your, your popularity uh, not being enhanced by walking into an organization and letting them know that there are resources available that they may not have known about. So ultimately, we're, we're entrusting the leaders in the in the room to be able to spread that word. And, and I, it's it's got to be an amazing uh, day and occasion when you walk in and you're able to to help those guys out. So so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Alex and Doug, thank you very much for all the effort and and the uh, success of your fundraising. Uh, on behalf of the mayor and the council and the citizens, we thank you. And I'm sure that after this, you'll be getting, uh, you'll hear from a lot of people in Niagara Falls that will need your That services. was the point. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. One to 6.1. Yep. Under deputations number 6.1, adult business licen licensing delegation bill. Yeah, there is, I uh, just wanted to point out, there is a bylaw on tonight's agenda dealing with this matter of the delegation of authority, uh, whereby the city will delegate their authority to enforce the business licenses for adult entertainment uh, back to the Niagara region. There are six municipalities within the region that would be affected by this, and the area CAOs have been meeting over the past several months to review and comment on this process, and have all fully supported this new business model with respect to licensing which also includes the transition of licensing and enforcement of other types of licenses from Niagara Regional Police Services uh, onto the region. Uh, tonight we have Jeanette Gomans, uh, who is the Business Improvement Manager with the Internal Control and Organizational Performance Division at the Niagara Region, and uh, she's with us this evening to present to Council this transition. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so on behalf of staff at Niagara Falls, we wanted to offer some support with content and being able to present the project and uh, put some facts forward so that uh, you can inform your decision today. Uh, we're here basically to move forward what's a, a delegation of authority. So I'll get into sort of the nuances of that in the presentation. So some of the key points to the project. Uh, currently, NRPS, Niagara Regional Police Services, enforces business licenses for taxis, Transportation network companies, that's your Uber type of taxi. Uh, Teamsters or vehicles for hire. Auto records, salvage yards, secondhand goods stores, and adult entertainment. Uh, Niagara is unique in its municipal peers in having police services enforce business licenses. Um, so we are looking to align with industry practice uh, as the majority of municipalities across Ontario enforce at the municipal level, not uh, with their police. NRPS staff have informally communicated that when the region takes back the business licenses uh, that we have jurisdiction over uh, on the upper tier, that uh, maintaining a unit for the adult entertainment where the jurisdiction lies at the lower tier or the local municipality tier uh, is not sustainable. Uh, we're currently working toward uh, taking that to the NRPS board to get a formal declaration of their position, uh, which is later this week on Thursday. And the project should have two phases. So our first phase is focusing on the migration, transitioning the unit from NRPS to Niagara Region, making that as seamless as possible and uh, to impact the customer as little as possible. And then phase two will be a review of the business unit. So it's operating procedures to ensure that they're operating efficiently, to ensure that it's a cost recoverable model and that customer service is high. So we did look at a number of models when we started looking at the opportunity to transition. Uh, Performance Concepts Consulting was engaged and submitted a report to Niagara Region recommending the use of a hybrid model for enforcement. So this would be um, a partnership between NRPS and Niagara Region uh, to ensure that public safety is upheld and that enforcement is effective and then as well as maintaining that customer service side. So when you have a business owner coming into Niagara Region to receive a business license, that they're receiving good service when they get there. Uh, so throughout the uh, process with the review of this report, there were a number of unknowns that came out of it that uh, when I was engaged as a project lead, we looked into. And what we discovered at that point was that jurisdictional divide that wasn't recognized in that report. So meaning the adult entertainment business licenses 
fall at the local area municipality level and the others I referenced, like the taxis and the auto wreckers and the secondhand stores fall at the upper tier. So we had to negotiate that because originally that wasn't uh, recognized. So we did a SWOT analysis of different business models to try to understand what we wanted to do with that. The first was a region only model, meaning the Niagara region would take on all business licenses. That would require a delegation of authority from the local area municipalities as you hold the jurisdiction over those adult entertainment pieces. So for us to take it all, we would have to negotiate those. The other is an LAM only model. So given that the LAMs already have business licenses that they're enforcing, uh, that they would take on everything from NRPS and absorb it into their, their current business. Uh, the third was a LAM region shared model. So basically, we would absorb back what we hold jurisdiction over. So whatever the, the upper tier has jurisdiction over, Niagara region would take, and the adult entertainment would be absorbed back into the LAM. And then a privatization. Uh, so at this point, we engaged the local CAOs uh, to inform them on the work that we had been doing with the project and also get their feedback as to where they might sit with it. And unanimously, uh, there was support for the region-only model. Uh, we also received support of this in our own leadership within the Niagara region. So with that model in mind, uh, we had a couple of decisions to make. So if it was to come to Niagara region, where would it land? Uh, so we made the decision to onboard it into the general manager's portfolio. So that's Chris Carter. And under Chris is a customer service unit. So given that there's someone coming in from the public receiving a service from the Niagara region and applying for their business license, we thought it was a nice alignment with his uh, unit. The other is to transition using the region only model. So again, we have to navigate those jurisdictional boundaries. So part of our plan is to come out to all the local area municipalities like yourself and uh, get a delegation of authority passed in order to take on the adult entertainment piece. And that we would use a partnership model with police. So a hybrid model is difficult logistically, uh, but a partnership model uh, is very seamless. So Niagara Region would be responsible for the enforcement of the business license. So making sure that those people out there exercising those businesses have a valid license and are meeting the criteria to have that license. And then any criminal aspects related to uh, the type of business that's related or any criminal behavior would be managed by the police and there would be a standard operating procedure developed to ensure that communication is uh, facilitated quite seamlessly. So next steps, as I referenced earlier, our date has changed a little bit. Originally we were gonna go in front of the NRPS board on June 28th, but it's been moved to Thursday the 12th. Uh, so Thursday, we're attending the NRPS uh, board to request that they declare their official position with regard to what they would like to do with the adult entertainment licenses should the Niagara region uh, take back those licenses over which it has jurisdiction. So we will report back on what that uh, turnout is at a later date. For you, the local area municipalities, the next steps are to get the delegation of authority approved at the councils. So currently there are, it's in fact five local area municipalities who have, sorry, six municipalities with adult entertainment establishments or bylaws, and five that currently delegate their authority to enforce that bylaw to NRPS. So you are one of those five. Um, and in order for us to, to exercise the region-only model, we require these delegations to be passed. And the Niagara region's preference is that all local municipalities participate in order to support that cost recovery model. So with the passing of your delegation, that will change who has the authority to enforce the bylaw on your behalf. So as a result, we'll have to update the documents that then go along with that. So your bylaw will have to reflect that Niagara Region is the authority that has the um, enforcement piece and the agreements that go along with the delegation of authority. So here in Niagara Falls, for example, you have retained uh, the appeals process. So if someone is denied a business license, currently the appeal comes here uh, to the city rather than going to NRPS. The plan uh, to initially onboard the region is not to make changes to the rules. We want to take the system that's already in place, bring it over to the Niagara region so that for the customer or the clientele that are uh, applying and maintaining their licenses, that change will not 
affect them. And then when we look at the business model, if there's changes down the road, we would fully engage the public in that process uh, if we were wanting to make changes later. So right now, the agreement that you have with NRPS would just be adjusted to reflect the Niagara region as the body, and the, uh, the, sorry, the bylaw would also be amended to reflect the Niagara region. Okay, and then for us, uh, in order for us to transition the business unit, we also need to pass a bylaw of our own. So we plan to, after we've engaged all of the local area municipalities in obtaining these delegations and seeing where we're at with that, we're going to return to our own council uh, to gain their approval of a bylaw to then enforce business licenses. Uh, either with just our jurisdiction and then depending on the outcome of the local area municipality councils, uh, fitting the adult entertainment piece in there as well. So that's a timeline. So basically we're looking uh, to try to get to everyone in July. We do have a couple of, of local area municipalities that we've deferred to August and then uh, looking to return to our own council after that. So that's all I have for slides. If anyone has any questions, I can questions? certainly answer Councilor them. Thompson? Well, uh, first thing is, uh, I would have liked to have seen that uh, a little earlier so we would have a, an opportunity to digest uh, all of the details. Are you talking about taking over all of the licensing for all of those uh, different functions that you showed here initially? The salvage, salvage yards, everything like that? Yes. Okay. So everything except the adult entertainment does fall to the upper tier jurisdiction, so we are looking to onboard that into the region. Okay. Maybe you could make your first stop out on Montrose Road uh, with the salvage mess <laughs> out there, I tell you. Anyway, um, have you had dialogue with uh, the adult entertainment people? I had a couple of calls today when they heard that this is going on. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good uh, move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I support that, but I really didn't have any details about this. Uh, is there going to be yes. dialogue with the stakeholders? Yes, absolutely. So the reason we haven't communicated yet is because we, the decision has not been official. So waiting for our own council to pledge support with the, the passing of the bylaw and then an information uh, a communication plan with information out for what that means uh, for everyone involved. Okay, I, I think uh, positive move and uh, I think that uh, uh, there's uh, complaints all the time about uh, the timeline on the weekends with respect to the licensing of the dancers. Is that going to remain with the police or is that going to be with the uh, with the uh, region? The, meaning the availability to apply? Yes. So currently, we're not going to change the hours of service up front. But again, once it's onboarded and we have it at the region, we are going to do a fulsome review of the business unit. And that would include engagement of all the stakeholders. So if they wanted I, to offer that feedback, they could. Yeah, I think the key element here is the uh, feedback from the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we don't have to listen to it. Anyway, I, I think a positive move. Thank you. Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Councilor Thompson is quite right. It's a lot to digest in a short time. Um, and he's right. I, I do wish I'd kind of seen it to more in advance. I'm not trying to be critical. More in advance, I could understand it. Um, we must have had some dialogue with the uh, police services board. Do you have a feeling from them? Or is this some? I know you're going to have the official discussion with them, but did they approach you about going down this road? Or was it initiated through the region to go down this road? So I was assigned to the project by the CAO, and my understanding is that the Niagara region has initiated the review of the services that it had uh, NRPS uh, delivering or enforcing on our behalf. And business licensing was one of those. And then through that review, the recommendation coming out of the consultant's report then fueled the project to move forward to actually do the, do the transition. So specific, Niagara region. Specifically, it's the premises to deal with the uh, adult. Entertainment. For you today, that is the premise. That's why, but that's why you're here for us. Exactly. For us, it's all of them. Everything that NRPS is in place. So the general public, what you're saying is that the police who were doing this through the Niagara Regional Police Services Board, 
this passes, they're not going to be doing it anymore, except maybe the enforcement, because they must have, as police officers, they have certain authorities. The enforcement of the business licensing would come to the Niagara region. If there's anything criminal in nature criminal attached to the businesses, that would still reside oh, with the that's police. Where, okay. That, yep. Okay. And what's the cost to the municipality? Is there a cost to the taxpayers if we were to go ahead with this? Or we no. Need, there's no cost. We're not going to be asked by the region that they need additional funds because there's a new model and uh, services are being delivered differently. And so Niagara Falls needs to pay more. Right. Whatever that is. That's, with that's their, not going to happen. No, with their model proposed, it should be a cost recoverable function. So we would recover the cost of the operating uh, with the fee schedule. And so if the public has a concern about an adult entertainment center, somebody underage working in it, then they'd be calling the region and not the police anymore. Correct. So they have to go into the region to get a regional office to have somebody. I'm just trying to get mm -hmm. this clear. So someone from within the region is going to have special authority? Do they have to be given any additional authority they already have in order to enforce, except the criminal part? Do they, they require any other authority or zero authority? Because the police have, well, we know they have unique authorities. Right. So as the owner of the bylaw, right. we retain the right to enforce the bylaw and we would hire a bylaw enforcement officer similar to your tobacco officer or your health inspector. And those people would have the authority to go in and inspect the license and ensure that A, that everyone there has a license as required, and B, that they're meeting the criteria to maintain that license. And then if it gets to the stage requiring prosecution because someone is uh, not following the letter of the law, then it's the region, you have regional prosecutors that would prosecute it, would come back to the police or through that agency? Correct, it would go from us through to the court system. To the court system. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Yep, no problem. Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick question, are you looking for a motion tonight or uh, mm. is there going to be something coming back to council in the, in the future? So I believe we provided a motion to staff. Uh, staff has uh, reviewed it and put it forward is my understanding. And we're really looking for the approval of the delegation of authority. So you would be delegating the authority to the Niagara region to enforce, administer uh, the business licenses for adult entertainment. Uh, do we have that motion? Well, what we have is we have a bylaw on the agenda. Well, that's going to be coming up later on. Yes. Yeah. Well, we you could you could certainly make a motion. Make, make, make a motion to approve that. that. Councillor Thompson. Yeah. I'd second. Uh, I'll second the motion, but uh, also uh, indicate that this has been going on for five, six years or so, uh, with dialogue with the stakeholders to try to change the format. So. This has been going on for a long time, and uh, to see that coming uh, here tonight, I think is uh, appropriate, and I think it's a, a positive move. So I would second the motion that we uh, endorse okay. the resolution and approve the bylaw. To delegate the authority to the region. We have a motion on the floor by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Thompson, that we delegate the uh, adult entertainment uh, licensing to the region, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any questions? I'll call the motion. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's still to be worked out. Yeah, once the business model will be reviewed at a later date. So I can't find them tonight? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, you can introduce the next yeah. item. Number 6.2, right? 6.2 trail operations, CN trail operations. Do we have Neil? Neil? Should we um, train operations? Yeah, Carl. 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 Sorry, Carl. Thank you. So <laughs> I'd just like to do a, um, um, a, a brief overview. Um, and on there it says trail operations. It really should say train operations. That's what so, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good evening, Council. Tonight our consultant WSP will provide you with an update uh, to the rail impact study. Uh, and it was, it, this came before Council uh, previously in May. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team uh, that helped put this together with the consultant. That's city and regional staff, the mayor, uh, Councillor Thompson, 
who has been actively involved in the rail uh, aspect for many years. Uh, I know we talked about it when I started uh, almost 30 years ago, so it's been there for quite a while. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we have, as part of the team, uh, an advisory uh, person who's uh, Gary McNeil, and, and Gary, if you want to stand, he's a special advisor, and he's also the former uh, president of Go Transit, where he was their president for 14 years. And uh, he definitely uh, uh, added many aspects to the review as we went along. And also to acknowledge a person, uh, Matthew Bilodeau, who's our transportation engineering manager, a uh, young guy who just started uh, with us. Um, in that position and he took over the lead as the, as the project manager and has done a fine job with it. So um, as you will hear tonight as well, there's been much um, public consultation and stakeholder involvement. So we've got everybody uh, engaged in this. And I think there was a mention from a council meeting that uh, after our, our first open house that there wasn't enough people responding to it. And we reacted to it and that was through our business development group uh, Dale Morton, who helped us put together some signs that I'm sure everybody saw as they approached the tracks. There was these large signs, please, if you're stopped, please let us know your feelings about it. So, uh, which was a great uh, addition and, and spurred about uh, over 500 uh, responses. So that was great. So uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Neil Ahmad. Uh, he's senior project manager with WSP and it's uh, all yours. Okay, thank you, Carl. And, uh Good evening. Uh, I have a series of about uh, 12 slides just to run through to give you an overview of uh, our study progress. Um, <coughs> we, uh, we start with a, a background here and uh, it's really just to set the scene of what we've been um, up against. Uh, uh, you'll know the CN Stanford sub, which is the one that diagonally uh, intersects the town and I will have a, a slide on that shortly. Uh, but there are 14 at-grade rail crossings on that uh, piece of track. Uh, there are regular uh, long train delays uh, on that particular piece of track uh, happening multiple times during the day. Uh, there are also breakdowns, you'll be familiar with that as well, and that's um, happening more often than anybody would like. Uh, so these instances, uh, regular and un 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 uh, unexpected, uh, cause problems for emergency services, firstly, uh, in terms of uh, providing for the services that they're required to uh, undertake. And there's also um, things about uh, the transit operations, getting buses on a schedule and, and uh, across those tracks uh, to provide um, an efficient service. All of these things are impacted by these uh, train movements. Uh, so there has been uh, a long-standing requirement to, uh, to find p potential solutions to this, and that's been the focus of our um, project. I would also note that uh, the study um, sort of uh, supersedes uh, and uh, uh, builds on a 2007 study that was undertaken to look at grade separations as a solution. So this is the uh, piece of track that we're talking about, the yellow one here, which is a Stamford sub, it is a CN track, and we've highlighted all of the 14 at-grade uh, road crossings in that uh, piece of track. Uh, I will note that some of these crossings are regional roads and so the region has been involved uh, throughout this, uh, this process. Our study is uh, multifaceted, uh, Carl mentioned. Uh, we have had a large uh, consultation process, but we've also been doing some analysis work. At the top there, you'll see the transportation assessment. We're looking at uh, uh, the delays that are caused by these trains, trying to actually get some numbers together that represent what the delays are and, and how to, how to uh, um, uh, bring that into the equation. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the potential of rail rerouting. It's another uh, large circle there. Uh, that's something that uh, I think is a very uh, positive potential. Uh, we are looking at the socioeconomic, what's happening in the community and the business world in terms of the trains and the, uh, the delays and impacts they cause, but also the services that uh, the rail uh, provides in terms of sidings to business. And we've also been undertaking some uh, public engagement, so I'll talk a bit about each of these shortly. This is our uh, study timeline here, uh, just highlighting on the uh, con consultation uh, events as they've been moving forward. This has been a very short study. It's about a six month uh, time frame overall, started in March. Uh, we had our uh, launch in, uh, 20, in April 2018 with a survey. Uh, ha had two open houses already, uh, one in April, one in May. 
and uh, today's uh, council presentation. But uh, we're going to be uh, finishing up uh, with some documentation uh, over the summer months. Uh, so our process has been to uh, to engage people, uh, look at a lot of available information because we wanted to really understand the problems, uh, the, the source of the problems and the extent of the problems, uh, really get that picture and uh, that helps us uh, together with the consultation, the input that we're getting from the community uh, to craft some recommendations. So uh, on the consultation front, uh, as Carl was mentioning, we had these signboards, you know, they're uh, illustrated in the graphic here. Uh, alongside the roadways at, at the crossings and uh, we've had a good response over 500 responses uh, through your website uh, and survey that we put together uh, to uh, get input from the community on this issue. Uh, we've had two uh, rounds of stakeholder meetings. Uh, we've engaged with uh, all of these, the emergency services in the area together with the regulatory agencies and the business community to get all of their different inputs on this and we've had the two open houses uh, at the community center. So uh, this has been a very positive and, and intense uh, consultation um, opportunity. The city has been heavily involved in all aspects of this. Um, we've got some uh, key uh, takeaways take from the consultation, the things that we've been learning. I, I've thrown a few of them up on the slide here just to give you some ideas about what we are learning. I'll uh, just quickly run through those. So we see that uh, of the people that we heard from, about 49% of them cross a rail track at least twice per day, and uh, at least 50% are delayed at, w at least once per day by, by a train. So these are pretty significant numbers. Uh, a lot of the people are delayed by for over 20 minutes uh, in, in these uh, issues. 20% uh, are rerouting uh, after about waiting for five minutes, and over 50% are rerouting after 15 minutes of delay. Uh, we note here that businesses, some of them are reliant on train services. They are requiring uh, siding access uh, to support their business. Uh, we've also learned, uh, of course, that the emergency services, the fire department, has uh, a strategy to uh, uh, actually um, uh, re respond from two different stations on either side of a track in the event that they have an emergency to respond to in order to make sure that they uh, get to, to a fire on time or, or an emergency. So everybody's adapting as best they can to the, the circumstances. And we've also noted it's um, student transport delays. Uh, school buses are, are also uh, a part of this picture. So uh, overall, we've got a lot of uh, good consultation. I think we're getting a good reaction from the community. They're very supportive of the idea of addressing this problem. So uh, one of the things that we were looking at was the uh, traffic picture. Uh, what's happening out there? We, we all know there's delays. Uh, we've actually tried to put some numbers to these things. Uh, we did some survey work recently, and uh, we were identifying up to four major these long trains happening uh, daily uh, with a cl total closure time of 30 to 35 minutes per day per crossing. So when you think about one of these trains coming through uh, four times a day and, uh, and 30 to 35 minutes over the course of a day uh, per crossing, that's a lot of delay time. Uh, and we also note in the second bullet there between 8,000 and 10,000 vehicles in total crossing that rail line during the peak hours, a.m. and p.m. peak hours. So there's a lot of potential for delay here. Uh, we've also noted at the third bullet there, the, over the four years between 2015 and 2018, there have been 21 CN train breakdowns. Uh, and these can come up to about two hours uh, in, in length. Uh, and 11 of those were over the peak hours. So these breakdowns are unexpected and they can take a long time to clear up but there have been a significant number of them over the four years. So one of the things we've been looking at, and I know you're uh, probably uh, looking at this as a, as a potential solution, is a rail, re rail rerouting. Uh, the idea of moving that through train traffic out of Niagara Falls onto other active rail lines. Uh, we have a rail specialist on our team uh, who's worked previously with CN and CP, and he's uh, got a good handle on what's potential here. So we have some ideas. We have three actual um, alternatives that we've been looking at. Uh, you can see them on the graphic here. The green line, which is the shortest uh, uh, improvement, would be to rerouting, uh, reroute trains across the Whirlpool Bridge, Whirlpool Rapids Bridge. Uh, it is a, a possibility. It does have some downsides, but it is something that was worth considering. 
Uh, we also were looking at the uh, rail, uh, the Trillium Railway as an option, the blue line there, which would bring traffic down, rail traffic down uh, outside of the city and down into the Port Colborne area to then reconnect with the uh, Stamford sub into the U.S. And we have a third re rerouting option, which is to reroute uh, trains onto the CP tracks from Hamilton. That's the yellow line, and it uh, would represent, a again, moving the, the through traffic out of uh, Niagara Falls and onto a, an existing CN line, in this case, which would rejoin the uh, Stamford sub uh, down at Port Colborne and into the States that way. So each of these different alternatives, they all have their opportunities, their benefits, but there are also implications and impacts that come with these. Uh, we are considering them and uh, need to also engage with some uh, key stakeholders in looking at these further. Uh, this graphic here, or the table is, uh, I'm not gonna go through all the detail of it, but we've been assembling a summary of uh, the pros and cons of all of these different options, uh, looking at what's, uh, what's possible, what are the the opportunities that they represent and where, where the uh, issues may be. So uh, we do have uh, uh, this to work with. Uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, moving this forward. Uh, as you uh, may see by the numbers of uh, benefits and the numbers of challenges, we do have a preference at this point, which is option three, the uh, line uh, out of Hamilton. It seems to be a good option and has a lot of uh, potential there. So uh, of the three, we seem to be favoring that one at the moment. Uh, in terms of uh, the overall project though, if we uh, find that we're not getting any traction with the, uh, sorry, uh, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, if we don't, if we have a, a, no traction with the uh, moving tr trains onto other tracks, if that doesn't seem to be uh, a, a viable solution, then we are gonna be looking for rail grade separations. Uh, and we just have an example here of uh, the potential of four rail grade separations. These are very expensive. Uh, construction uh, uh, jobs and we've estimated that each of these uh, would be in the five to six year range for planning design and construction uh, and if the city were to undertake these incrementally or sequentially that would represent up to 20 to 24 years of implementation time uh, to get all of these four um, um, in built and, and operating at a cost of between 25 to 60 million dollars uh, so there's some pretty significant costs and pretty significant times uh, involved in that approach as compared to rail uh, rerouting. Uh, I've just got a couple of more slides here. So uh, we just wanted to note that we are going to be doing a, uh, an assessment, uh, bringing all of these different alternatives, both the rerouting and the grade separation options into a common base, which is a cost benefit analysis. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at that to uh, look at that picture, see what's pr providing the best benefits uh, for the cost, and uh, we will be looking at things like tra uh, vehicle travel time savings, uh, improvements in, in collision rates, uh, improvements in vehicle operating costs because of idling time and, and that sort of thing, as well as environmental savings, which again come back to idling time at the rail crossings, people waiting, and we're also looking at rail travel time. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at, and that's an ongoing act aspect right now. Uh, last slide here is our next steps, and it's really just to highlight that we are going to be doing that cost-benefit analysis uh, shortly, and we do need to have some discussions with these rail uh, companies, both the CN and CP, uh, and perhaps Trillium Rail Lines to talk about these uh, ideas we've got. Uh, we will be bringing a formal recommendation uh, to you uh, later for direction and approval. Uh, and we are continuing with some consul uh, documentation over the summer months. Uh, and there was the last point there to uh, the city does want to monitor the rail traffic to continue to watch for any violations uh, of CN operations uh, waiting on the tracks too long, that kind of thing. So uh, that's the sort of thing that's um, going to be happening over the next uh, little while. And uh, that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. I think you have questions. Uh Councillor Annoni and then Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, where your discussions with CNCP will take place after this whole purpose is done, as you follow your steps? Uh, we are uh, completing a report, and maybe Carl's probably better place to answer that question. So, uh, what? what 
is needed to do is we need to uh, complete our report, complete all their analysis, and then uh, present it with CN or CN and CP and have discussions with them. So that basically, you have to have your background information in order to sit down and talk with them. Otherwise, they won't talk to you. Thank you. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council, when I went to Halifax to FCM, there was a CN booth there. And their, their executives were at the CM booth. And you wear your tag. And when they looked at my tag, they went, oh, you're from Niagara Falls. It happened to be the same day we were having the public meeting here. And she said, no, I'm very, very familiar with Niagara Falls. And I kind of chuckled and I said, you know, they're having their public meeting in regards to potentially moving the rail line. And the gentleman with her said to me, I don't know how old you are, but I can assure you in your lifetime, that's never going to happen. And he said, do you know how many communities are lined up in front of you to have this happen? And another, because it became very young, um, interesting with my Niagara Falls tag. And they started to hand me documentation. This was the first documentation they handed me. And it was their transportation of dangerous goods. The second one they handed me was the CN working with our neighbors for a brighter future. And it highlights what they're doing in communities. And the second and the last one they handed me was CN safety is a core value. And they said to me, even in Lac Magentic, we are not rerouting everything. And what they are rerouting is 12.8 kilometers. It's costing the federal government, it's costing between the government and the, the feds in the province of Quebec $133 million, where the feds are picking up $60 million. He said, get in line. Hmm. So while I understand we've never wanted to assume the cost of an overpass, I think the numbers that you put here are very alarming and it says, oh, we either have to move it or we're not going to have one or the other. 12 years ago, had we approved the overpass, it would have been $14 million. I still have that report sitting at home. I, I, I think Janice Wing and I were the only two here who voted for the overpass, but it was $14 million at the time. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of missed that boat here where it's going to cost us very much more, but I would hate to think that we are putting all of our apples in a basket and believing CN, CN is going to reroute. Because when he said line up behind all the other communities, they all want to reroute, it kind of sent a very clear message. And I don't want us to put everything into that one solution that comes down to CN deciding for us, and then the federal government funding them to do that. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to give council the update of what took place at, at, at FCM. Carl, did you want to answer that? Because I have Councillor Thompson. Yes. Um, if I can get uh, perhaps uh, Mr. McNeil to just respond to Councillor Iannone on that issue. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing, uh, unlike Lac Magentic and, and others, uh, this is really more of a traffic delay issue than safety issue. Uh, the train movement through the, the city is actually fairly safe because the trains go so slow. It's um, a fairly safe operation. But what we're trying to do through our business case model is not only look at the benefits to the city, but there's also benefits to CN and CP for relocating the through train movements. It's a shorter route for CN. We know that they can save a lot of money in their maintenance. It allows some freedom of movement of the GO train service along the Grimsby subdivision into Niagara Falls, which can avoid some additional track that might have to be built if there's freight trains there as well. So we're looking at a comprehensive business case analysis that actually we're hoping to encourage CN to make the move because it'll make good business decision for them. Councilor Anoni, you want to answer? Uh, you, and I'm not, I'm not arguing yeah. with you. I'm, yeah. I'm relaying to you the message. But the part that I had forgot to highlight was they asked me if, we, if Niagara Falls really believed traffic interruption was as important as public safety because there are public safety issues in communities that want to reroute the train. So thank yep. you for highlighting that. Yep. But, but it was said to me very sarcastically, you really believe you're going to be on a priority because it's traffic interruption and not mm -hmm. safety. So I'm just relaying. And, and when they hand this, they said, this is what we're, and in Lac Magentic, they're actually trenching down yep. as opposed to, to, to make it safer. They're building it so if the train comes off the track as it's trenched down, there won't be a, the, it, you, they won't have the catastrophe they had when they at the, when the train derailed, but 
they kind of shook their head in disbelief at me. So I, I just wanted you to understand that. And they were very aware of what we were doing down yeah. here. Yeah. Councilor Thompson? <clears throat> yeah. Um, how long have we been talking about this? Uh, you were anyway, talking about before I was born. At, pardon me? Before I was born. Well, <laughs> well, we got rid of one of them, uh, which worked out extremely well. But, uh, you know, I, I think the key element, and I can't talk about this without uh, mentioning uh, the committee that was set up and functioned for probably 10 years or more, and the key uh, person involved who has passed away, the late uh, Red Isipan, uh, he actually had drawings uh, of all of these alternatives uh, years ago and was uh, so uh, knowledgeable about this issue. And uh, I, what we're doing now is gathering information. And I was really impressed with what I could see, your alternatives. And as soon as uh, I got to the end and I read uh, the two letters from uh, Olio and uh, Bruce Ward and his uh, group, uh, all of a sudden you have to say, uh, there's got to be a mixture of what we can do here. And if you're talking about building overpasses, uh, $60 million, they said, uh, I think uh, in uh, his report, uh, Matthew, uh, said $60 uh, million. Uh, if you had so many of them, uh, it would be over $300 million. And uh, is that going to happen? Uh, in your lifetime? I don't think so. Uh, or nor, huh? But one can. Huh? One overpass can. Uh, well, I think that's what we're probably talking about. Uh, some opportunities uh, to service the uh, industrial properties that we have to think about, reducing and bypassing as many of them that don't have an interest in coming within the municipality. Uh, and you can't do that without having all of the information. And I think that this uh, study and the final analysis is really going to be helpful in uh, easing some of the traffic through the city, uh, still servicing uh, some of the uh, few industry that we have, uh, and uh, the safety issue with some of the toxic chemicals that are going through our areas and uh, the uh, rail damage that happens periodically. So all of these things are so important to us. And uh, by having this information, uh, we can finally make a decision, maybe one, maybe two overpasses uh, with uh, servicing what we have to, but getting most of them out of the area. I think that's the uh, objective here. And uh, the one that uh, Councilor Iannone was talking about, the people in the area were so upset that we were going to put an overpass on Morrison Street for $15 million, not 14, $15 million. Uh, they were so upset. We don't want that in the area. And the council made that decision because of the public coming out and objecting to it. That's what happened. But I think we're on the right track. Get the information, and then we can come up with the best solution. Maybe it's not going to affect everybody around the table uh, to, uh, with this council, but uh, it's going to be good for the uh, community in the long term. And it may, may be 24 years. Councilor Ioni? And in that frame, if we're looking at both solutions, um, I think we missed the boat there in having maybe 15 people from a street decide for the rest of the community whether an overpass went there and what, what was the better good, what was the greater good, putting the overpass there so emergency services could get over or, or bowing to the wishes of 15 residents. I, I really think we missed the boat there. We're 11 million up now. But I want to make sure that we're looking at both possibilities at the same time and the city is looking at putting in the, uh, a possibility of an overpass in our potential future budgets. Because I would hate to see us get to the point where CN says, that's not gonna happen, we told you it's not gonna happen. 
and we are still years behind in our emergency services. They're still sitting on a train while somebody who's having a heart attack is waiting for them on the other side, and perhaps we're losing a life because there was a dollar amount we didn't want to reach or we didn't do it quick enough. So I'd like to see us looking at both opportunities at the same time and the city factoring that into the budget. Carl? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, this, this report does look at both op uh, options. Uh, of course, with, with, um, uh, with a focus towards um, uh, the solution that's best, uh, and it may be the relocation. It doesn't mean the elimination of the tracks. It just means the reloca relocation of the through traffic. Uh, so business businesses, uh, if it is relocated, could still be served. So this report will deal with that. So when it comes back, we'll be able to look at both options. Are there any other questions? Is the uh, recommendation is that the report is for the information of council. Staff will be providing a complete project update following the next steps identified in this report. So they're not looking for any action. Moved Councilor, file. moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Henry, receive and file. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. No, uh, it's, adver it's advertised for 6 p.m. It's advertised for 6 p.m. Six. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, sorry, all in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Planning matter 7.1. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce the next item on the agenda? A yeah, public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a single detached dwelling on a vacant parcel of land located on the south side of Lyons Creek, west of Stanley Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on June 8, 2018 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Mr. Hernovich, would you please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. This application is uh, for a property on the south side of Lyons Creek Road at the uh, foot of Stanley Avenue. The uh, property is, uh, is uh, a zoning amendment for um, 0.32 hectares of land to allow for a single uh, detached dwelling. The property is vacant at the current time. The property is zoned conservation open space, which doesn't permit a dwelling. And the request is for the property to be rezoned R1A, residential single family, 1A density, um, in part and in part environmental protection area. The uh, property to the north uh, of this is vacant. To the northeast is the uh, Oakland Golf Course. Uh, there are residential properties uh, on either side of this property and the property backs onto the Lions, onto Lions Creek. The uh, proposal is to construct a uh, single detached dwelling. It's outlined in red on the map. Um, Lions Creek Road is at, at the top, and that the property has a frontage of 54 uh, meters. Uh, they're proposing that they would have a uh, side yard on the east side of 8.7 meters, a building height of seven meters. Um, there's an existing flood line. It's shown in green. Uh, they're proposing that the uh, uh, flood line be altered, that's the line in black, so that the, uh, there would be filling in this uh, triangular area. That's uh, an approval that they have uh, permission through the Conservation Authority. Uh, the rear yard between the back of the building and the back lot line is uh, 51 meters, but we're also looking for a setback between that uh, new flood plain, which would be an EPA, Environmental Protection Area, of 1.47 meters. On the uh, west side, they have a 22.6 meter wide side yard proposed. This is also the area where the septic field would be located. Approximately 80% of the lot would be landscape, 20% of the lot is uh, building. Um, and the uh, total lot area is uh, 1,256 square meters. Um, 
So we, in examining this application, it complies with the provincial policy statements. Um, the property is in the built up boundary for the city of Niagara Falls. Uh, the property is currently undeveloped and is an infill lot and it would help in achieving the city's intensification target. The official plan has designated these lands in part residential and in part uh, environmental protection. Uh, they want to, as I said, construct a single detached dwelling um, on the portion of the lands that are designated residential. The new house will fit with the character along there. The environmental protection area will correspond with the PSW, the Provincially Significant Wetlands, along the creek, and it also reflects the floodplain that I've, I've, I've mentioned. Um, and I already mentioned the flood line will be altered through a cut and fill permit. Uh, the zoning for the property is currently zoned conservation open space under the uh, old Willoughby bylaw 395. This property, this zoning will bring it under the Niagara Falls uh, zoning bylaw 79200 as a R1A zone. Uh, the existing regulations are in the uh, uh, middle of the, the chart in front of you and all of the uh, dimensions that I propose uh, far exceed the uh, minimum requirements for this property. Uh, we are setting the whole of the property as the minimum uh, so that um, the property couldn't be severed in the future uh, if they were just to use the R1A standards because the property is not on a uh, municipal uh, uh, sewage system. Uh, the proposed uh, zoning amendment can be supported because it exceeds all of the zoning uh, requirements for that R1A zone. The rear yard depth of the property is 51 meters and it protects uh, 1.47 meters to the, uh, the floodplain. The PSW and associated buffers are uh, well uh, away from the building and would be under the environmental protection zone. We will be placing this property uh, with a holding provision. That's because the region is looking for an archaeological stage two study. Uh, it's quite common where, um, where properties are locate, located next to water courses to require such a uh, study be undertaken. Uh, therefore, we found the property or the proposal does comply with provincial and regional regulations. The Conservation Authority has no, uh, found that there is no negative impact. The property is designated residential uh, in part and environmental in part. The requested zoning will implement those in official plan designations. Therefore, staff is recommending that council approve the zoning bylaw amendment uh, to rezone the lands as residential single family R1A and environmental protection EPA zone with a holding provision for the stage two archeological study. Those are the highlights of the application. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Are there any questions from members of council? Seeing none, Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign in the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Anyone other than the applicant that wishes to speak? Okay. Seeing now none, oh, council, oh. I'm sorry. Uh, would you please come forward? Come forward and state your name and address for the record. Good evening. My name is Leslie Tanner. I own the property directly south of the proposed property across the creek. Um, my question is more on the environmental side. I didn't quite understand, is it a dual residential and environmental protected area? Because I have an environmental protected area along the creek and I was just wondering what would the new property or the new zoning be on the creek? Mr. Hurdovic? Uh, yes, Mr. Acting Mayor, to you, um, to, this, to the speaker. So the environmental protection will be, if you look at the map, Everything that's on, on the left side, there's a green line that it jogs up into a point. Yes. That point will be filled in and they will come straight across. So the green line following the dark black line and then back to the green line. So everything between there and the creek itself uh, will be environmental protection. Mm -hmm. 
on the oops. Before I do yes. it. So this is the shore, the, the mm -hmm. bank of the of Lions Creek. So all of this area will be environmental <coughs> protection and it'll only be the front lands next to the road that are zoned for residential purposes. So Same. one house right there, mm -hmm. the septic field is right there. There's really not much room for even putting a dog run. Um, there's so there's no building going to be in that floodplain? No, I, <laughs> I'm not sure that anybody would want to build in a floodplain, but uh, no, no buildings. Because if it's environmental, you can't build in there as long as it's stained environment. I'm asking because um, I don't know. There will be no buildings in the EPA zone. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Thank much. you, sir. Is there anyone else that has any questions? Seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Hello. Hi. Uh, yes, we are uh, proposing to this, uh, um, it's gonna be our retirement bungalow basically. It's a simple structure, just a one story. Um, we will of course not touch the EPA zone at all. Um, we're well, 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 well aware, aware of that, and um, we uh, we hope you approve. <laughs> okay. Are there any final questions from council regarding the application? Seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. That we move the recommendation. Are there any questions? I'm left-handed. <laughs> uh, any questions? All in favor? Uh, carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, would you, could you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a two and a half story, six unit apartment building on lots 79 and 80 of plan 193. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the planning act on June 8th, 2018 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you. Mr. Planning Director, could you please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed amendments? Yeah, so for council, this uh, application involves uh, three blocks of land on the, uh, the west side of uh, Kayla Road, just above Brown, so Brown Road is here. Taylor Road is here. This is Niagara Square. The Wego building is just off the map. This is the Warren Woods uh, plan of subdivision. The, um, so, so again, the, uh, the three parcels of land all front onto the west side of Kayla Road uh, between McLeod and Brown Road. Uh, the lands to the west are uh, developed for residential purposes. Uh, the lands to the east are partially uh, wetlands and partially developed for residential purposes. Um, so there are three parcels that I've outlined, so we'll step you through that. The applications before you tonight are for both a zoning change and vacant land plan of condominium. So the most northerly block would have 31 townhouse units and eight quadruplex units. So the townhouses are shown in yellow. The quadruplex units are in blue. They're basically townhouse units. Oops in this location, I would have blind anyone. These are basically uh, townhouse units, the four units back onto each other. Um, so the, um, the next block to this, the south are for 38 townhouse units. Uh, they would be served from an internal uh, driveway and uh, the, uh, um, there's cur currently construction trailers on this and a detached dwelling which will be demolished. The uh, most southerly of the three parcels 
would have 37 townhouse units. Um, they're looking for, again, a site-specific zoning served through uh, an internal uh, road system. The uh, SciTech was circulated because uh, of the policies in our official plan, and there's an arc that moves through a part of this property. SciTech has requested that the building heights be limited to 10 meters or three stories on parcel one and the lesser of 10 meters or two and a half stories on parcels two and three. And they also would like a warning clause in any of these sales agreements, uh, which uh, would accompany them to let them know that there is a major industry nearby. That's a fairly standard clause. We did have an open house um, on May 22nd. 15 people came out. Uh, they were largely concerned about the shortage of parkland uh, in the Warren Woods area. What was explained, there's a small parquette in the phase one of Warren Woods. There's to be a major parkland in phase five, which is just to the west of the, uh, the Warren uh, Creek. Um, the, uh, they did talk about the amount of traffic going down Taylor Road, uh, and staff said they would be looking at uh, traffic calming and sidewalks on Taylor Road um, as part of uh, an ongoing study. The, uh, the official plan calls for these lands to be uh, developed with medium density housing. The uh, targeted range is 50 to 75 units a hectare. This project is actually slightly under that at 36 to 39 units a hectare. Um, the, uh, but there are some alternative guidelines in our, Warren, uh, or our Garner South Secondary Plan, which provides that they could have a density of 53 people and jobs per hectare. Um, when you combine the three plans together, uh, they actually would be achieving uh, 55 jobs and persons per hectare, uh, which would satisfy the uh, overall uh, requirement of somewhere between 50 and 75. Um, the units that uh, front onto Kayla Road will uh, be developed with um, a facade that looks out onto the street, so rather than the backs of the building, the front will be uh, facing the street although the units themselves will be accessed uh, from the inter internal portion of the site. So again, looking at block one, it's currently zoned R4 uh, with a special provision 856. Um, so they were looking to alter 856. They want to delete the apartment unit use. They only want to develop with townhouses and the uh, quadruplex units that I mentioned earlier. They would have a block coverage of 40%, whereas the standard R4 zone is 35%. Uh, they are looking for a three-story uh, height, uh, which would comply with SciTech's request. Um, their height would be 13.5 meters uh, for the townhouses and 15 meters for the quadruplexes, but that includes the peaked roofs. So that would be a requirement under the zoning that they have peaked roofs. Um, the, uh, there are roof uh, one-story porches, which actually encroach into the uh, side yard areas of the, uh, of the property. And so they're looking to, uh, they're allowed to go 2.3 meter or 2.5 meters into that yard. They would like to go three meters, which is just under 10 feet. And uh, we're supporting that provided they have a minimum of 1.5 meters from any lot line. That's the same as the, it's actually a little higher than the side yard that we typically require between a, uh, a single detached dwelling and, uh, and a lot line. The, oops, um, <coughs> excuse me, so uh, looking at the apartment use, they're going to replace those with uh, quadruplexes, so we're satisfied that they could uh, remove that. Uh, they're going to maintain the separation distances, and the townhouse units would have a height of uh, three meters, uh, or three stories rather, which is um, the same as what's currently allowed. The actual height itself would be only slightly larger than what is currently permitted by the um, zoning bylaw. On the second parcel, uh, they're basically looking for very similar provisions. It's currently zoned development holding. Uh, they would be zoning that as an R4 zone, again, to delete the apartment use. They would increase the coverage from 35% to 40%. And again, they have roofed over porches, which would project into the uh, required yard areas. And again, maintain, we would require a mean that they maintain a 1.5 meter setback. So again, you can see they're looking to reduce the 
setback on Kayla Road from six meters to 3.4, which we have allowed elsewhere in this community, um, as long as garages, but the garages are actually here. You can see the driveways internal to this, and there is a requirement at the rear yard um, that's um, reduced from 7.5 to 2.5 per unit seven just because of the angle on the property. This is where the storm pond um, is. And then there would be a side yard um, building height from se uh, for unit 17 as well of 3.5 meters. Uh, again, we're supporting this uh, because the, uh, apartment, the apartment use is not proposed on this site. Um, the reduced setbacks for units 9 and 17 are due to the irregular lot shape. And the current height uh, regulations are acceptable um, and should be limited to 2.5 meters. Again, in accordance with SciTech's wishes. Uh, the last parcel, um, again, rezoning this property from an R4 special provision 1000 to a new R4 zone. Again, deleting the uh, apartment use um, and then adding for it the coverage of 40%, uh, restricting the height of the building to two and a half stories um, and um, to uh, reduce the exterior side yard that's along Kaler Road uh, from six meters to 3.4 meters. And um, as well, the uh, uh, this one unit here, no, uh, number 17, is actually a little bit closer, it's 2.4 meters. Uh, but it's just at the corner of the, uh, the unit to the lot line, and so therefore that is acceptable. The privacy yards are being reduced from 7.5 <coughs> meters, that's the area behind the buildings. Um, that would be reduced um, to um, seven meters from uh, 7.5. And then the, um, oops, sorry, that's over here in this area. Um, and then the, again, the, the requirement for the roofed over porches to project into any yard. Uh, again, we are supporting all of those uh, requested changes. Um, the, uh, those are the zone changes. The application is subject to a condominium design. So again, this is a vacant land condominium that will allow, allow each of the units to be sold separately. There are a number of conditions that would have to be fulfilled. Those are attached to the report. Um, one of the requirements is that the units that front onto Kayla Road would have facades that look like the front of the building. Uh, the typical conditions would be the site plan controller addressed through the condominium agreement and there's a, a requirement that the driveway on parcel two be shifted slightly southward from the lot, uh, north property line to provide for snow storage. The, um, therefore, the application does conform with provincial and regional policies. It conforms with our official plan for Garner South, provides uh, for appropriate development standards for the form of condominium proposed and addresses the city's and regional uh, interests. Therefore, we are recommending that the vacant land of condominium be draft approved up to the conditions and the appendices that the mayor is designate be authorized to sign the, the draft plans as approved after 20 days of notice and that the draft approval be given for a period of three years. The mayor and the clerk would be authorized to execute the condominium agreement and the application to amend the zoning as I've outlined uh, are um, all uh, to be carried out. Those are the highlights of this application. Thank you, Mr. Hulovic. Are there any questions of Mr. Hulovic from any members of council? Council Crater. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Worship. I just have one short question, Alex, because I am asked about this by the, by the public. In that section that you referred to, 40% <coughs> 35%. So what, 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 the, what the general public asks me is, like they say, if you go to Kayla Road, and I'm just telling what they tell me, is if you go to Kayla Road, Kim, you can jump from house to house. They're that close together, there's no gap. One fellow said to me, if I yell at my wife, the whole street will hear me, because everything is so close. So I'm just, what I'm asking is, when I support this, am I bringing the houses like closer together and less land in between, is that what we're doing? that 35 40. Is that what we're doing, please? When we're going, through you, Your Worship, when we're going from 35% coverage to 40% coverage, it means the houses are getting bigger because they're townhouses, they're all attached to each other anyway. Um, so, um, but they're basically larger and because there are covered porches, 
It used to be in the old days, people just wanted an outdoor deck. They were happy to have the sunshine. They now want to be able to use that on rainy days as well. And once you put a roof over a deck, we count that as lot coverage. So that's typically where the lot coverage gets bumped up. It's not because the units are getting closer to the lot line, it's because we're covering the deck with a roof. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Any other members of council have a question for Mr. Hrnovic? Seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at the public meeting. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to, to speak to the proposed amendment. Anyone other than the applicant would you please come forward and state your name and address? Uh, my name is David Lepp. Uh, I live at uh, 8492 Sweet Chestnut Court, about four blocks from the proposed uh, area. Um, I could go home. I could put on a suit, uh, but I don't feel I need to. Hopefully I can appeal to you as a, a human being. I live in this community, my wife and I both. Um, there was mention made of not uh, enough uh, park land. Uh, it, it, at this point in time, Empire has made, uh, I believe, one little park area for children. Uh, we take our grandkids there. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, much more of that needs to be done by the Empire community, if I may say that. <laughs> uh, we do not strike back at the Empire. Um, in our neighborhood, there is a term, investors, which is a new term to us. We're not talking about 1800s going to Nevada and buying a silver mine. We have investors who come to our community, our, our neighborhood, um, and what we find is that investors come from the GTA, shall we say. Uh, many of them do not uh, share our community. Uh, in that uh, we own lawn mowers, we dig uh, gardens, we try to maintain our neighborhoods. Uh, within eyeshot of where my wife and I live, there are two Airbnbs, uh, one of whom uh, is a, a renter. He does not own the property and he has uh, Airbnb residence. Uh, someone from Niagara Falls Municipal Department came and uh, contacted him. He uh, said he does not have an Airbnb. Uh, the person asked, why do you have a lockbox on your front door? His response was, um, I, it was there when I got here. I don't know how to get it off. He had not mown his lawn. Uh, in the entire year and a half that he had been there. Uh, your bylaw officer then said he should mow his lawn. He said, I'm an environmentalist. Well, I looked up environmentalist in my dictionary and it said, uh, lazy and do not own a lawnmower. <laughs> However, uh, the bylaw officer said, you need to mow your lawn by such and such a date, or the city of Niagara Falls will uh, add it to your landlord's uh, tax bill, which I get, I'm cool with that. Uh, he, he hired a neighbor to mow his lawn. Um, he had uh, a weed in his lawn that is well, it's about this high. It's no longer there, but that's the situation. Uh, we have a number of investors in our neighborhood. Uh, not enough um, parkland for our children, grandchildren, I'd, I'll give you that. Um, 
and, and as I say, I don't have my suit on. I can't do uh, my 7.5 uh, meters to 7 meters. Uh, I'm just speaking to you as a human being who wants to live in a Niagara Falls neighborhood. Um, does Niagara Falls want to have we don't need more Clifton Hill. I mean, that works. The casinos work. But if we want to have a place where people want to come, where they want to live, it, it, it shouldn't all be rentals with people who do not own a lawnmower. That's, that's, that's a pretty short an excuse. But um, when, we, when we talk about when we were told about our medium density living uh, when we moved to Niagara Falls in good faith, did we want really, really high density living? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I beg of the city of Niagara Falls, I ask of you folks who are representatives, is this you what you want? Minutes. Do you want people want you. coming here? Sorry, no, we're good. Okay, yeah. Uh, I notice my uh, my counterpart is uh, making notes. Uh, again, I do have nice clothes if I need them. Well, <laughs> up, I don't think anyone cares. Yeah, um, however, uh, I, I, I believe I've made my point, and I don't want to take up more of your time, but. Um, I've expressed the opinion of myself, my wife, and many of our neighbors. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Herlovic, is there anything there that you can answer? Well, <laughs> I guess about the only thing that I would respond is that um, these units are, will be condominium developments, which means that the owners will be paying uh, their, um, their common expenses, and so typically those are the properties themselves are managed by a management company that comes in and plows the grass and or plows the snow and cuts the grass. Um, so it could be that someone could buy a unit there as an investor. They're still going to pay their uh, co condominium corporation fees. Those fees are going to go into that kitty. Um, so I would hope that these properties would be well maintained. Um, I can't guarantee that somebody might not buy them. Uh, whether they live in town or out of town um, and rent them to somebody else. Um, the people who are renting there uh, for the most part are living there um, and our enforcement officer, as the speaker said, are going out and trying to get these um, Airbnbs closed down. We've been successful with many, some are less cooperative and obviously one who is uh, renting and somewhat removed from the actual owner uh, may be a little more difficult, but we will get it over time. And the only other, the only other thing is that the uh, property standards uh, by law officers, that's not unique to this area, they do that all over our city. Is that that's correct. Is there anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposal? Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor. Your Worship, if I could just ask a question on a point that was brought up, uh, and I agree, there are a lot of investors coming from Toronto area buying into new buildings in our community. Is there a message being sent out or a condition in the uh, uh, building permit that says that these facilities cannot be used as Airbnbs? Mr. Hurlovic? Uh, typically that wouldn't be a condition of a, a building permit because that would be governed by the uh, building code itself. So, um, but, but our bylaw enforcement office is fairly adamant. I think you know, through the meetings that we've had with this council, I would say a year ago, I got a few, a handful of complaints. Um, I get a handful of complaints every day from people saying that there's one next to them, across the street from them, down the street from them, um, photographs of cars and partiers. Um, so our enforcement officer is, is working hard to, uh, to get it underhand. Well, to that point, I realize on the agenda tonight, we're, we're hiring two new uh, bylaw enforcement officers. But in my mind, based on my feedback and the, the complaints I get uh, from Airbnb 
situations, we need more than two bylaw officers. But I think it would be really important, any new construction going on, we need to set the, set the message out there that these facilities cannot be used for Airbnb if they are in an illegal area. Okay, we'll try and get that message out. Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you uh, to the gentleman, uh, that was a great presentation. Mr. Lapp. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a couple things. Um, I know we were, you know, today we're just dealing with the land matter and the development. I understand what you're saying. Uh, for example, uh, and I wasn't going to bring this up, across the street from where I live, they sold the house. Guess what the house is now? Guess what I see every day in my neighbors? It's now an Airbnb. And I did quite understand, I wouldn't have understood when you talked about the walk, except I went over to the house to take a look at it because the grass is this high now. And it's a shame to see it. And the backyard is a jungle now. But you're right, they had this big walk on it. And then we started watching in the last two weeks people coming in, going out uh, constantly. And so the point I'm making is when you see all these developments come on board, you know, you've got the <coughs> road, but that's, sadly, that's exactly what you said is happening. Yeah. There's more and more people that are buying the homes and not living in them, and they become Airbnbs. And Today, before I came up to the in-camera meeting, I stopped to say hello to a friend of mine. I said, how are you doing? There he was standing at the, uh, at, uh, the bylaw office. And what he's upset about is he lives in a condominium. One of the people who live in it has now made it into an Airbnb. And the owner of the condominium has said, if you want to deal with this, you go to the city of Niagara Falls. They have the bylaw. I don't have any authority over this, and he's still going to keep having his parties and his up. Now that, and parties and all the other activities, and that's a condominium. That's a condominium. And I said to him, yeah, but it's in a condominium. The owner of the condominium has jurisdiction. He said, no, the owner says, it's the city of Niagara Falls. They enforce the bylaws. They don't allow these things. And they're in certain areas they allow them, and other areas they don't. We're in an area where they don't allow it, so the city should be up there saying, this is an infraction of the city bylaw, shut it down. So here he was at City Hall, and when you see Gerald, who's done a great job uh, for the city, and he's, he's asked to present all this evidence. To, he's got to give the evidence because we got to take him to court. And now this is digressing from why we're here. We're here because we've got an application for a land proposal. Mm -hmm. But what you brought up is happening more and more throughout this whole city, and whether it's the new development or the existing development. People are suffering because people next to them are running businesses that they shouldn't in the legal operations. I know we're getting off the topic, but I just want to tell the gentleman, you made a good presentation, congratulations. Yeah, is there anyone? Thank you. If, if I may, I, I, a buddy of mine is a counselor in the city of Oshawa, and he said the federal government bumped it to the provincial, provincial bumped it to municipal. It's now your, Problem. it's yours to deal with. Um, yeah, yeah, the only thing is, Mr. Lepp, this is a planning meeting. This is really not a meeting about oh, yeah, Airbnbs. Sorry. So, I'd like to get us back on track. Is there I anyone else? Anyone, anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to speak on the planning amendment? Seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Good evening. Uh, we submitted a, a slide deck for uh, council this evening through the planning department. I'm not sure if the clerk has that. Anyway. Uh, sorry, I do not have that. It was not forwarded on to me. Councillor? Yeah, I just have a question for the applicant. Um, in, in regards to his the last speaker's uh, um, comments, and in council's package, we have a, a petition for a request for another smart want to give him a chance to get off his phone. Oh, sorry, I'm saying the presentation to the clerk. Um, yeah. another, My apologies. Um, they're asking, they have a petition with a request for another small park or play area because they don't think what they have is adequate. Are you gonna be addressing that through your presentation? Uh, no, I will not. Um, in, in regards to that, what I, what I can uh, state is that um, parkland dedication was already taken for part, uh, parcels one and three 
that have been outlined. Um, okay. Parcel two where the sales office is. Okay. Um, cash in lieu of parkland is being taken for that with the understanding that that larger park that the director spoke about okay. is being constructed in the near future. So that will satisfy the contribution of parkland by the developer. So then through you to Mr. Holman, yes. is that happening? Yes. When? That just so that we could give him a time frame? Um, and the people on the petition? Um, well, the, the land that's been provided as part of Warnwood's phase five, and the, uh, so once the land is uh, donated to the, uh, or given to the municipality, then we'll talk about the parkland uh, the construction, what elements are included in the design of the parkland. Um, so it's a bit of a timing issue in the short run, um, but uh, fact, we could expect that the full park would be in place within the next year and a half or two years. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. And what, that's what I wanted to make clear to the people who signed this petition so that they didn't think by presenting it to us they would have a park this summer or right. any time soon. So thank you, Mr. Holman. Okay. Okay. Um, um, evidently, the uh, presentation was not loaded um, and we can't get it on here. Uh, so it's, we, had, uh, we had some images to show you just to kind of speak to some of the, the concerns about. Uh, that we heard this evening, especially about what the built form is going to look like, uh, specifically what a quadruplex is going to look like, um, and we we're hoping to share those with you uh, this evening. So my apologies, I should have brought that on a USB stick. Um, I guess I'll have an abbreviated uh, presentation at this at this point. Um, the one thing that that I would I would add, I think the director is rather thorough in his presentation, um, is that there was that 2.4 meter setback. Um, pertaining to block 229, which is parcel three in your report. Um, it was acknowledged uh, by the director that that is supported. Um, it's something that we flagged through our submission to the city, and we have some documentation through the zoning review, uh, and we are just directed to request of council that a friendly amendment be passed on as part of uh, any approval of this to ensure that that gets into the bylaw so that the, the unit can be built as, as proposed. Um, I can answer any further questions you have. Are there any the development. questions from council? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and plan of vacant land condominium is now concluded. Does any member of council wish to make a motion? Councilor Thompson. Move the recommendations. We have a seconder. Second by Councilor Peter Angelo. Are there any questions to the motion? All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Councillor Crater and Councillor Campbell opposed. Motions carry. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce the next item on the agenda? Yeah, uh, the planning script may sound familiar here because I read it inadvertently for the previous application, but our planner did cover uh, what was being proposed to be permitted and at the uh, proper locations. So planning meeting number three is a planning, is a public meeting now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a two and a half story, six unit apartment building on lots 79 and 80 of plan 193. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on June 8th, 2018 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who would like notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Mr. Herlovic, would you please? Explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. The uh, application is for a vacant uh, parcel of land. It's actually two lots fronting onto the north side of McLeod Road. Uh, immediately to the east is a church parking lot and uh, the uh, Lutheran Church just on the edge of that parking lot. The lots had been owned by the church at one point. They are zoned currently institutional. To the east and to the north are single detached dwellings. To the south are, is a Kojiko building and commercial properties. The hydro power canal is just to the west and the QEW interchange just west of that. 
Um, the proposal is to rezone the property. Uh, that is the two lots, or in the darker grayish color here, uh, to rezone those lots from an institutional zone to a site-specific R5A zone to permit a two and a half story, six unit uh, apartment building. The uh, proposal is, uh, the two lots are currently vacant. Uh, it has a lot area of uh, almost a little over a quarter of an acre. The original intent was that the lots would be developed for single detached dwellings. Um, however, that has not happened. And the uh, applicant had previously applied to this council for a car wash on these lands. That application was denied by council in 2017. Uh, staff's review of that application had suggested that uh, the site was appropriate for uh, an apartment building up to six units. Um, the, uh, we had a neighborhood meeting in June. Uh, we had nine residents come out. They had concerns about the fact that the property would be uh, used as a rental property and, um, the, um, and the impact that uh, renters may have in their neighborhood. Uh, however, we would note that the city's vacancy rate has dropped to 1.8%, uh, uh, so there is a need for rental properties in the city. The applicant noted that the uh, units themselves will be geared towards seniors. The uh, provincial policy statement and the provincial growth plan uh, both uh, encourage the city to intensify their um, urban lands, and we have a uh, requirement that we have 40% uh, of our new units built within our built-up boundaries, um, and this unit would, uh, this development would have, um, uh, would facilitate doing doing that as well. That would make more efficient use of our existing infrastructure, <coughs> and it provides an alternative form of housing at the edge of a neighborhood which is predominantly low density housing. The uh, official plan is that has the lands designated residential. McLeod Road is a uh, arterial road, and the densities uh, along arterial roads uh, range from 50 to 75 units. Um, this proposal would have a density of 54 units per hectare, so just slightly above uh, the minimum expected. The proposed building height is uh, consistent with what is permitted through zoning on the surrounding properties, um, and the, uh, there are additional setbacks. So if this was a single family house, for instance, it uh, could be 10 meters in height, would have 1.5 meter or 1.2 meter side yards and 7.5 meter rear yards. So these uh, setbacks are slightly greater than that. Um, the, uh, as well, we reduce the number of entrances onto McLeod Road because there's a, a single uh, parking lot in front of the building. And as I said, it will address the shortage of parking in the city. So looking at the site plan, the building itself is here, straddling the two single lots. So the, this would be the lot line coming through here, one lot and two lots. So they've maintained uh, the greatest distance, which is one half the building height on the west where there's a single detached dwelling. And they push the building to the east because there is a parking lot here and therefore less impact. Um, the property has a nine meter rear yard proposed. If this was a single family house, the minimum could be 7.5 meters, so it is higher than that, um, although it's, it's slightly short of the 10 meters by, by about three feet. The, um, the, they're also asking for relief. We typically have a requirement for a wall uh, along uh, parking lots, but we're suggesting that it would be acceptable to have a landscape berm instead of a wall as a uh, change in the zoning. So that, those are the uh, changes site specifically and for the R5A zone on this uh, property. The um, current uh, density provisions uh, would support 5.5 units on the property. Uh, they've rounded that to, uh, to, six, um, to six units, uh, which was uh, fairly standard. The rear yard depth is nine meters, I mentioned. Uh, however, we do not believe there would be a measurable Im impact. These two lead property line, or lot line uh, abuts a parking lot, and we can use plantings to screen that. Because those are two, they are two lots in a registered plan of subdivision, we do need to deem those not to be lots so they can be operated as one property for the uh, proposed development. And we would bring that deeming bylaw back with the zoning amendment. Um, 
So the, uh, we found that the development does conform with provincial and regional policies. The proposed development conforms with the city's official plan with respect to the type of units, the density of units, the form of housing that's proposed uh, and that we would expect on a arterial road. The requested R5A zone permits apartment buildings and the requested site specific regulations are appropriate to ensure the development will be compatible with the surrounding properties. Therefore, staff is recommending that Council approve the zoning bylaw amendment uh, to an R5A zone, permit a two and a half story of six unit apartment building subject to the conditions I outlined, and that Council approve the uh, request to pass a bylaw to deem lots 79 and 80 not to be lots of kind of subdivision. Those are the highlights. Any questions of Mr. Hurlovic from members of Council? Seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign, the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Anyone other than the applicant, please come forward and state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Susan Rogers and I live at 7149 McLeod Road. Your Excellency and City Council members, I am here this evening on behalf of my neighbors and residents in the community regarding the rezoning of the above lots to accommodate a two and a half story, six unit apartment building on the above land. We oppose this proposal for the following reasons. With this building right next to our property, we are concerned the value of our homes will depreciate and make it difficult for resale if and when we choose to move. The extra traffic congestion caused from six more residents plus their guests visiting on an already very congested thoroughfare will make it more difficult to exit our driveways. We are concerned that our view of the street will be obstructed even more from the higher traffic flow. There are already enough accidents on our street from the entrances and exits to the existing commercial buildings and this change would make it an even higher traffic accident risk area. The road widening will encroach so close to our home that the traffic will be even closer to our front door. This already causes problems with vibrations of our home as well as our plumbing when vehicles drive by. We stand to lose a portion of our already small driveway and frontal property. Significant damage has already been caused to our home from the construction taking place in the past year. During my last discussion with the region, I was told that a special type of pavement was going to be used to cut down on noise and vibration, but at a significant cost. If this was too costly, then they would be removing our homes and we would not have an answer to this question to this until 2019. I was told at the meeting in June that the city planning department would try and get information on this, but did not hear anything back regarding it. I wouldn't want to see someone spend their hard-earned money on building an apartment building to see it torn down in a year. If anyone could shed light on this, that would be great. We cannot afford to suffer any more green loss in our city. McLeod Road is a gateway to the city and casino off of the highway. Is this the impression we want to give our visitors? They will be greeted with little to no green space as they arrive. All of the neighbors on the block are deeply concerned about this proposal going forward and are against it. If this proposal does pass, we would like you to consider the following for the residents. Please assure us that the City Planning Department and Council will receive a copy of the site plan before it is put forward for approval. We would like to be assured that the property will not be sold and rezoned at a higher level and have something else built. We have seen this happen in the past and don't want it to happen in this situation. At the very least, give us the residents a guarantee that this will not be the case if you don't see fit to oppose this bylaw change. Thank you for considering our concerns. Sincerely, the residents of property surrounding lots 79 and 80. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hurlick, would you like to address the concerns or any of the questions that you can address? I don't have any real, <coughs> excuse me, response to that. McLeod Road is a major road. It's a regional road. Um, 
know, the speaker probably is more familiar with the timing. She spoke about a road widening. I don't know when the region is going to widen this portion of McLeod Road. Um, I don't know anything about the pavement, and I'm not sure what the promise was that my staff might have made in June about getting her additional information about the road pavement. I'm, I'm not, I didn't understand that. Um, so I really can't answer your questions. Okay. Is there anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment? Anyone other than the applicant? Come forward, state your name and address, please. My name is Tom Vadavaz. I'm the um, I'm the owner of the property, and I think um, I think the greatest concern with the neighbors. The owner of the property. Yeah. Of no, the property. I'm the owner of the property. Yes. The, the, the property in question. Seven, yeah, the property in question. Yes. Yeah, you're but not the, ready for you, yes. you were not ready for you. Yes. Sorry. Oh, not ready. Other okay. than the applicant. Okay. Sorry. Anyone else other than the applicant? Oh, okay. Sorry. Seeing none. Council will now hear from the applicant. <laughs> this is my first time in a long time, I'm sure. You good? Okay. I think one of the major concerns here was uh, actually parking, and um, and um, you know we 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 talked about this uh, this being an issue in the past that you know putting a resident over there and trying to back up on the cloud road is nearly impossible. So we 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 took the liberty of you know pushing the uh, making a a, a driveway at the front of the property, having four, uh, uh, four par or eight parking spots in total, kind of throwing it to the right of the property and providing a, a, a turnaround radius that would be sufficient and safe for the occupants to kind of get out of that property um, and with the proper setbacks, allowing for future development, okay, should region decide to widen the road, uh, we allowed for that as well. And, um, and um, I'm, I'm not opposed, you know, to, and I'm not, I don't like the landscaping in the front because I, I think it would block uh, views uh, from the driveways from people backing up uh, for, the, for the neighbors specifically. Um, but, you know, if, if council wants, I mean, if uh, planning wants that, I, I'm for it. So, um, so th those issues seem to be the greatest of the issues, um, and uh, those, uh, those are the ways they have been addressed. Okay? Okay. Are there any final questions from council regarding the application? Council Crater. I just had a question to, uh, through you to, uh, to Tom. Yes. But, uh, uh, Susan had mentioned, I'm just wanted to get your thoughts on this. She had mentioned uh, that if it moves forward, you're moving it forward. Am I correct? That's what correct. She's, correct. So it's your development, you're going to go with it. That's why you've come here. The yes. other thing is, and I told the residents because they called me, I said, you move forward with this proposal because after the first one was turned down for the car, car wash, when you went to the city, they gave you direction of what could be allowed. This is one of the things that the city recommended. If you're going to go ahead, this is one of the things that fits there. So yes. that's why you came back with this. Uh, the last thing was, um, would you feel uncomfortable if part of the motion that we make um, includes the fact that when the site plan is put together, which is how the building's going to be laid out and everything around with it, that the residents have a chance to look at it and have some input in it? Because normally they don't. Once we pass this, then it stays inside City Hall and the residents don't have some an opportunity to at least look at it. Would you feel uncomfortable if that was put into the motion if they have that opportunity to take a look at it? Um, you know what? I'm not opposed to that you know, at all. It's pretty easy going. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it all. I'm trying to go with, I mean, I have to do something with you the land. I mean, I'm not going to let that land sit, no, so can't. I'm kind of going with, you know, the direction of council and, and the, the planning department, and, uh, and that's why I'm moving it forward, because something's got to go there, and, uh, you know, I think the, the suggestion by planning was good, and, and so I thought, you know, this is a, a, a perfect uh, building, perfect size. I try to, you know, fit, fit it in and try to convenience uh, everyone by pushing it to the right, away from the neighbors on the left so there wouldn't be a noise problem that way. And uh, I don't think I could have made a better plan than what, it, what we put together. Thanks. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Councilor Strange. Yes, yeah, Mr. Mayor and to Tom. Just a little disappointed you didn't have your drone footage tonight. Yes. I really, uh, liked that last yes. time. Yes. <laughs> you know, you liked that last time. 
you know, maybe next time. Okay. The public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Does a member of council wish to make a motion regarding the proposed zoning bylaw amendment? Moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Strange. Are there any questions? Councillor Crater. I would like to see if we could include and, uh, yes. include the, the, the uh, Okay with the mover? Okay with the secondary? With the that the plan. residents be involved yeah. in the site, site plan? plan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Mr. Clerk, could you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Yes, moving on to our fourth uh, planning public meeting, which is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit the establishment of a gasoline bar on the west side of Victoria Avenue between 4835 and 4893 Victoria. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on June 14, 2018, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who would like notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovic. Could you please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment? Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. The uh, proposal is to add a, uh, a gasoline bar as one of the permitted uses to the GC zone to develop the property um, with a car wash, retail store, and a gasoline bar. The property is currently zoned general commercial, um, and uh, the retail store and car wash are already uh, allowed on the site. The, uh, we did hold a neighborhood meeting uh, on June the 4th, two people attended. One of the residents uh, across the uh, street on, or on 2nd Avenue was concerned about additional flows getting into the sewers. Um, the car wash will um, require that there be an on-site storage for the, uh, the water to be released slowly into the uh, storm sewer. Um, and municipal works are confirmed that there would be then no impact uh, from this development. Uh, the other concern came from one of the uh, convenience stores own owners who was concerned about the number of uh, retail stores that were per permitted. As I say, a retail store is already allowed. The uh, property itself is this uh, irregular shaped property in blue. It's right across from our the city's public library. Tim Hortons is to the north. Uh, counting offices to the, uh, to the south. There's a, uh, a long condominium building here and a vacant residential property in this location, and then single detached dwellings uh, basically on the north side of Wilmot Street. The um, proposed uh, development then is for a driveway entrance onto Victoria Avenue and another driveway onto Valley Way. The, uh, there will be three gas pumps underneath a canopy on the property and a retail store uh, towards the southerly uh, extent of the lot, uh, parking for anyone using that store, and again, the, the anybody paying for gas uh, that would come into the store and they would pay in the store. Um, the car wash uh, is located on the western part of the property, uh, and they uh, are providing the required number of stacking uh, for cars to enter that car wash. Uh, it should be an automated car wash. The door would enter once you punch in the code and uh, the car would leave uh, in this direction. So the door would be closed once the car enters the, the building and then exits uh, the building. There's a far, uh, the, initially the, the car wash was posed right against the lot line. They did move it uh, about three and a half meters away. Uh, they've incre cre increased the amount of uh, landscaped uh, open space uh, as well a, uh, tra a uh, Noise study was submitted so that there will be uh, noise walls along the property line. There will also be some acoustic barriers on the roof of the buildings uh, for the mechanical uh, services, which I'll outline a little bit later. Um, this, this strange tracking um, pattern is actually how a, the gas uh, delivery vehicles would, would enter the site. The uh, tanks, underground tanks, are in this location. 
and the, the, uh, the trucks would then exit the site onto uh, Valley Way. The uh, property is currently vacant. Um, the uh, Provincial Planning Act and the Provincial Policy Statements uh, do require that uh, we make more efficient uh, use of our urban lands and to make uh, use of our public infrastructure and services. The, uh, there are adequate municipal services and infrastructure to accommodate this development. The official plan designates the lands as minor commercial. The zone, uh, zoning amendment will meet the intent of the official plan as the uh, commercial use serves the local residents and businesses. It fronts onto an arterial road where our policies encourage service stations gas bars and car washes. The uh, uh, development also provides significant areas of landscape to compensate for the um, area which is required for on-site uh, vehicle movements. The noise study I mentioned, so a four meter high sound barrier next to the uh, condo apartment building at 4866 Valley Way, a five meter sound barrier at the entrance and exit of the car wash, which would be the noisiest areas of the building, and then a 2.2 meter high rooftop uh, barrier to screen the car wash mechanical equipment, and a two meter uh, rooftop acoustical screen on top of the retail store to screen the uh, mechanical equipment located there. Um, the, uh, as I said, the property is already zoned GC. It permits a, gas, uh, a car wash and a retail store, so they're adding the, the gasoline bar, which is basically this portion of the development um, as well. We would be requiring, uh, I mentioned this, the, uh, the two and a half meter uh, fence along the residential property. The condo building is right here. Um, there are some other houses in this location and the, and the uh, accounting office on the corner. Um, we're looking for an interior side yard width of 3.7 meters instead of uh, six meters um, as required for car washes. And then the uh, interior side yard um, is uh, five meters rather, or 2.9 meters rather, rather than five meters as required by the uh, gas station AS zone. The, um, the zoning amendment uh, can be supported because there be uh, minimal noise impact because of the uh, mitigation measures uh, that are recommended. And uh, I've already talked about the, the walls and the acoustical screens a couple times. Uh, I mentioned the gasoline delivery trucks will come from Victoria and exit onto Valley Way. Their times for delivery are to be limited between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, delivery would be once or twice a week. Uh, Cities Engineering Division is satisfied that stormwater management servicing and uh, grading can be uh, accommodated. The uh, setback of 2.9 meters uh, for the gasoline, well, it says kiosk, but it's that store. They, you pay for your gas inside that store. It would be located uh, within the retail store. Retail store, um, if they just build a retail store in the GC zone, there is actually no minimum setback for a retail store per se. Uh, the north wall of the adjacent apartment building is brick. There are no balconies or windows. And the east wall has only a few small windows. There's several small windows. Uh, there's no parking uh, in that. Uh, um, area and there's an amenity area on the uh, site plan for this development. Uh, site plan will uh, address the site layout, the servicing, the grading, the stormwater, uh, any mitigation matters, the lighting on the site, the landscaping and, and signage. Um, <coughs> excuse me, it, it's uh, a number of whole and part lots uh, on a plan of subdivision. So again, we need a deeming bylaw passed that would be done on the same night as the uh, amending zoning bylaws actually presented to you and uh, we would deem these not to be lots so that there is no conflict between uh, building straddling lot lines. Um, therefore the proposal does conform with provincial and regional policies that will serve local uh, residents and businesses. Uh, it does front onto an arterial road where we expect these kinds of uses and where vehicular movement can be minimized. Uh, the building has been demonstrated to that mitigation measures will adequately address the impact of the car wash. And the site design provides for adequate landscaping and screening from adjacent residential properties and site plan control will be used on the site design and mitigation measures. Therefore, staff is recommending that council approve the zoning amendment application to 
to add the gasoline bar on the vacant lands at 4835 and 4895 uh, 93 Victoria with the provision of the four meter noise wall along the westerly lot line and that the council be um, um, approved the request for the uh, deeming bylaw um, on, on the next council agenda. So those are the highlights of this application. Thank you, Mr. Hardwick. Any questions of members of council? Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I have some serious concerns about the uh, gasoline trucks going up Valley Way. There's uh, schools along there. It's very busy with a lot of uh, uh, children back and forth to school. I noticed that in the recommendation there was some uh, uh, request that they be limited to certain hours. I would prefer those hours not to be during the, the uh, times that school is in operation. Um, if it was on the weekend, I, I think that that would uh, take away some of my concerns. Uh, it's it's uh, gonna change the whole neighborhood with respect to that type of traffic. And I know it's only once or twice a week, but uh, Valley Way is not something that uh, should be uh, have uh, gasoline trucks running up and down it. Carl? Thank you. If I can address it, um, in the report, it, it's, uh, it's really a path from uh, Bridge Street. So they're coming in off of a bridge along Victoria into the facility and then back turning a right onto Valley Way, not left. We would restrict that. We wouldn't allow trucks to go that way because that is a school zone and there's uh, residents in that area. So what it would do is it would go back towards Victoria again, make a left back to bridge and then back to the highway. I'd have to look at the, that's what we have right up here? Yeah, that's that's what it's indicating. Okay, so where's, where are the gasoline trucks coming in? They would come, so they would come off of Bridge Street. They'd make it right onto, uh, onto Victoria and they'd come along Victoria, make a, a right into the facility, yep. drop off the gas, come out of the facility, turn right onto Valley Way, head back towards Victoria, make a left onto Victoria, and then left onto the bridge, and they would go out to the highway, uh, back to Stanley, and then off to the highway. So the intent is not to have them go through the residential area of Valley Way. Help me understand where uh, Tim Hortons is there. It's right next door. Which next door? Back Sorry, to uh, Alex will point it out. Go back to the other side. There you go. Right there. Right. So the truck maybe you can track the movement on there. So it's going to come in from. It's going to come out. Come down Victoria. Yeah. Through the site here. Yeah. North on Valley Way back to Victoria, and I think your concern would be going past the front of St. Patrick's uh, School. Is that your concern? I didn't see that on that other map. That other map showed, showed them going up Valley Way towards 2nd, uh, 3rd, uh, and 4th. Well, well, no, not well. Go, back, well. go back to that other. Uh, it's got them going up Valley Way. Right, so yeah. the, the traffic is coming in from Victoria. Yeah. The library's here. And so it turned. So it, if you pick up your copy of Tim Hortons, you're driving right there along the same property line and you're exiting in front of the building. This, the trucks are going to come in from Victoria, travel in this direction and go out. There's some little arrow symbols here showing the direction of the truck movements. So it goes past the old review build, uh, the Niagara Falls review building? It yeah. goes in that direction. The Niagara Falls review building is here, yeah. the gas station on the corner okay. is here. So it won't be going past the schools? Not the, no. Okay, I'm sorry, I was confused. It's okay. Thank you. Any other questions from members of council? <clears throat> members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local <coughs> planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Anyone other than the applicant that wishes to speak? See done, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Mr. George. Uh, good evening, your worship pro tempore and uh, members of council, staff and the general public. I'm just here to answer any questions. We're obviously in support of the application. I should point out that uh, my client has 
I made considerable efforts in working with uh, planning staff to accommodate all the concerns, including many revisions of the building location to increase the amount of side yard. We've also committed to, in fact, uh, increasing the access to the uh, sewers <coughs> and uh, water um, pipe, pipes across of the uh, street to Victoria, which is a fairly expensive um, project, but it will accommodate the extra water flow, including uh, the water tanks that were designed on the property as well, so that it would be uh, a staggered release into the system. So it won't affect any of the residential areas um, to the uh, west of the, the property. And as uh, Councillor Campbell uh, pointed out in his concerns, uh, the design features were uh, put that way to incorporate turning in front of the review building, not back into the residential area, and then back out onto the main um, access roads. So if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Any questions from members of council to Mr. Radichek? Seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Does a member of council wish to make a motion so regarding move. the proposed? I move second. Moved by Councillor Crater, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh, the recommendation? Any questions? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Say. Mr. Clerk, could you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Yes, the final uh, planning public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to zone the land's site-specific resort commercial establishment in part and environmental protection area in part at 8215 Heartland Forest Road. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on June 12, 2018 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their names on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Planning Director, could you please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment? Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. The uh, application involves the lands of uh, Heartland Forest. Uh, there are approximately 200 acres uh, south of Brown Road and on the west side of Heartland Forest Road. Uh, the proposal is to uh, rezone a portion of the property as um, recreational commercial and a portion of the property as environmental protection, um, which are the two zones that are currently on the property. Uh, the uh, land holdings are approximately 80, acre, or 80 hectares, 200 acres. The zoning amendment is to adjust the limits of the resort commercial and uh, the environmental protection zones currently on the property to uh, correspond with the official plan. The current zoning permits a comprehensive resort um, development and protects the natural features on the, um, should say, western portion of the lands. The remainder of the lands uh, are heavy um, and general industrial zones, and the zoning is being undertaken to satisfy a condition of the Committee of Adjustment for a corresponding severance of land. Um, so looking at this air photo, um, we can see this is a Warren Woods development up here, Brown Road, Kayla Road, Heartland Forest Road. This is the Wego building here. Uh, the Interpretation Center is located here on Heartland's property. And um, <coughs> the whole holdings of uh, Heartland Forest are these. A large portion of the westerly part of these are uh, provincially significant wetlands and designated as environmental protection in the official plan. Um, the lands to the south is this Thompson Creek, this wavy land, or line. These are lands that have been purchased by SciTech from Heartland, which necessitated this uh, uh, zoning change. The um, uh, official plan then is, uh, does re have requirements that the natural heritage features uh, be protected. Uh, normally this is determined through a, an EIS, however, we are following the uh, boundaries that were established by the Ministry of Natural Resources on their provincial mapping. Uh, the proposal complies with the city's or with the region's official plan 
with respect to its natural heritage feature policies. Um, our city's official plan, so the, <coughs> again, the property is, uh, this is Heartland Forest Road, Brown Road, so the largest part of the property is um, provisionally significant wetlands and designated as environmental protection. The um, red cross hatched lands are resort commercial lands where it says SPA 35. These are the lands that were acquired by SciTech. Um, so the, uh, land, the lands in question are only for the Heartland Forest uh, property. Um, the, um, there is a setback of 1.09 kilometers from Garner Road. Uh, this is to protect the SciTech operations to the west. Uh, the resort commercial uses are therefore only allowed to, to the east of that arc. You'll see it in, a, in another slide. The proposed zoning does comply with the official plan because the zoning would implement the official plan designations uh, and respect the SciTech arc. The EPA and ECA features will be protected um, and the buffer lands with uh, passive uses that are currently uh, approved by the NPCA and resort commercial uses are limited to lands along Heartland Forest uh, Road and consist of the recreational education facilities uh, contemplated by the <coughs> official plan as well as a campground use. So the current zoning of those, the land, kind of have to look underneath these red lines, but there is a thin little strip of land which is or zoned environmental protection. The bulk of the lands are actually zoned uh, heavy industrial which doesn't make any sense. Um, and then a portion of the lands are zoned general industrial in this location. And then we have resort commercial lands here on Heartland Forest. So the intent is to extend all of these lands uh, along the frontage of Heartland Forest Road as a resort commercial, and then remove the heavy industrial zoning uh, from the back half of the property and rezone that as environmental protection. So basically, the environmental protection 655 zone that's on this little strip of land will be extended all the way back. And the RCE zone that's currently on this northerly portion will be extended all the way down to these lands. Um, the, um, uh, as well, there is a holding provision in the, in the, um, in the bylaw for, um, for storm services. Um, so we would be adding the recreational uses um, to the list of uses, except for a skating rink, curling rink, or community center. Any indoor activity um, would not be allowed, but basically some of the outdoor activities that have been developed over time, like the outdoor golf, the hiking trails, and so on, would all be allowed. We'd be defining the multi-purpose building to include assembly hall, day nursery, place of entertainment, private club, restaurant, retail store, and silly offices, and recreational uses. Those are all the forms of uses that uh, have occurred in there from time to time or do currently exist. Uh, as well, we would be permitting <coughs> or restricting the trailer camp use to only be that area that's 279 meters south of uh, Brown Road. So basically, the northeast corner of the Heartlands uh, property. Uh, we would also be permitting accessory buildings. You might be aware that there are um, various structures on the site as well. They're building some uh, washrooms to serve the uh, facility as well. Um, the, uh, in order to accommodate the, uh, the changes, we're proposing that this zoning would apply to the whole of the land. That is 200 acres. We'd have a minimum three meter setback for the interior side yard. Uh, we'd define the maximum density height as 10 meters or three stories. Again, you can see that's consistent with SciTech's request. Uh, we increase the maximum accessory building floor area from 200 square meters to 262 square meters and decrease the width of the landscaping strip along the uh, Heartland Forest Road from 15 meters to five meters and provide that there will be only one loading space. And I mentioned the H uh, provision is on there for stormwater facilities that would be with respect to new structures that's largely the campground which is the, about the only use that's not currently mm -hmm. developed under the zoning. Um, again the uh, environmental protection um, zone will maintain the lands in a natural state. It will recognize the existing trails and walkways 
small scale buildings that are already existed. Any other future facilities will require the approval of the NPCA uh, in order that they can ensure the ecological functions of the uh, site are not further affected. Uh, therefore, staff found that this uh, application does conform with uh, provincial policies um, with respect to protection of the natural heritage that implements the official plan designations, satisfies the condition imposed by the Committee of Adjustment and the proposed site-specific RCE and EPA zones recognize the existing use and provides appropriate regulations. Therefore, we're recommending that Council approve the zoning amendment application to zone the site-specific uh, RCE zone in part and EPA zone in part, uh, subject to the regulations outlined in this report and that Council pass the amending uh, bylaw that's included in tonight's agenda and that Council direct staff to initiate the changes to Schedule A of the official plan to result, adjust the resort commercial establishment boundaries and the environmental protection designations as they pertain to these lands. Those are the highlights. Any questions of Mr. Hrlovic from members of Council? Seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Anyone other than the applicant? Seeing none, Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Representative, Mr. Richardson. I'm here this evening with Mr. Bowman, uh, and I'll be very brief, but I wanted to give you some background. This is really a tidying up of planning controls on this property. Some years ago, the council rezoned that portion that Mr. Herlovich described as RCE, which permitted the multi-use building and all of the development that's occurred there outside of the woods. But in doing so, the balance to the west, the huge portion of the property was left zoned industrial. It's been preserved by Mr. Bowman, as you'll know, and developed in a way that it's open to the public through walking trails and so on. <coughs> so we were here to clean up that, that uh, industrial zoning. More recently, uh, Mr. Bowman entered into a transaction with SciTech to sell the southerly portion of his lands, uh, which has created that straight line boundary there uh, everything between there and the and I call it SciTech Creek, I guess it's Thompson's Creek, um, uh, has been sold to SciTech, and uh, which injected some money into Heartland Forest. But it also SciTech demanded not only the land but certain conditions with respect to the future development of the lands. And so the previous zoning permitted in the upper right-hand corner a campground. There had at one point been a contemplation of a campground. SciTech has demanded that we reduce that area, and that's part of the regulation that's in the bylaw before you this evening. Um, and uh, as indicated, the balance of the site is all to be zoned as an EPA area. Um, we've had ongoing negotiations with SciTech leading right up till today to be sure that it was in agreement with the bylaw that's being presented to you tonight. And I believe both Mr. Herlovich and I have received an email from SciTech solicitor today indicating that they're content with the bylaw that is before you. And so we are content with it as well. Uh, we're grateful for the staff report. And I want to say that uh, Mr. Herlovich and Mr. Meck have worked closely with us in getting the solution with SciTech. And I want to thank them uh, in, in front of council today. Um, so those are our submissions, Mr. Chairman, subject to any questions you may have of Mr. Are there any questions from council? Seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment no is now concluded. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. The recommendations as they're presented. Are there any questions? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Number 8.1, report to council from Janet Lepier. Leeper. 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 Receive and file by Councillor 
Peter Angelo. Councilor Crater. I, I apologize. I did have one question on the last application. Is it appropriate to ask it? I don't know. Right. It's closed. All right. That's fine. Well, I'm going to ask it. Anyway. Sure. Then you can tell me it's closed and I'll sit down. Can we, can we now tell uh, 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 Mr. Bowman that he can go ahead with uh, whatever development he wants to proceed with? He wants to put in the washrooms out there. He wants to do it immediately. That's, and we think we all know that. So can we, in our indirect way, say go ahead and put uh, them I up? Don't, I don't know how to answer that question. You don't have to. What's that? There's a 20-day appeal 20 period. 20-day appeal period. So they're saying yes, they He's can gone. do it. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what's Council's feeling on 8.1? Receiving file by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange. Any questions? Conflict. Conflict noted by Councilor Iannone. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 8.2. What's Council's wishes on 8.2? Receiving file by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Tom. You second it? And talk on it? Yes, I, okay. I just uh, want to say that uh, it's kind of nice to see um, positive uh, resolution of uh, these situations uh, by the integrity commissioner. Um, I think that's a great way to handle with mediation and uh, apologies if necessary <coughs> and uh, a positive report back to council. I, I like what I see, and ho hopefully that's the format for the future. We have a motion on the floor by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Thompson. Any other questions? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Under reports, the municipal accounts, moved by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange. The accounts. Any questions? All in favor? Opposed? Carry unanimously. 9.2. Niagara Regional Housing Property Tax Exemption. So moved. Moved by Councillor Thompson. Second by Councillor Strange. Are there any questions? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. 9.3. Matters arising from MHC River Road. So moved. Moved by Councillor Thompson. Second by Councillor Campbell. Are there any questions? All in favor? Okay. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Uh, 9.4 and 9.5. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo. Second by Councillor Thompson. 9.4 and 9.5. Any questions? All in favor? Carried unanimously. 9.6. I can't keep up here. Points. Oh, my fingers are too big for this. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. Any questions? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Resolutions 10.1. Uh, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Any questions regarding 10.1? All in favor? Carried unanimously. 10.2. Terra Vitas resolution. 10.2. So moved. moved by Councillor Campbell. Second by Councillor Strange. Are there any questions regarding 10.2? All in, all those in favor? Anybody opposed? Is that uh, they're related. They're related? Related? Is that okay? Okay. All those in favor? Yep. Carried unanimously. Communications and comments of the clerk, 11.1. .1. Niagara Region petition elected officials to a higher standard. The feeling at council. Councilor Pierre Angel, second by Councilor Campbell. Any questions, comments? 
All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Heartland Forest. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. Moved the recommendation. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. 11.3 for council consideration. Moved by Councillor Campbell. Yes, absolutely. Second by Councillor Strange. Uh, celebration of Nations. 11.3. Uh, consideration of sponsorship opportunities for Indigenous Arts, Culture, and Tradition. Is, no, this is in St. Catherine's. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I understand what you're saying. I would suggest we receive and file. Receive and file by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Uh, Eleven point four. Night of Art. Moved by Councillor Thompson. Relief from the noise by the Second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Eleven point five is Niagara Region the motion respecting trade. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. Any questions? All those in favor? Carried unanimously. 11.6, Taps Brewery. So moved. <laughs> moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. 11.7, Stanford Center Volunteer Signage. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by This is, I mean, this is now a city park. So, right. I mean, uh, you know, these are things that uh, honestly, uh, you know, should be worked through with staff. I mean, I don't understand why they need to come to council. It's a city park now. So, um, do we not have a mechanism in place uh, with staff where they can approach staff and, um, I guess, run these things through? Uh, it should be part of our normal parks budget. Um, as opposed to coming and receiving special approval, that's my only. Okay. Well, my, uh, who wants to answer? My only Councilor uh, Peter Angelo's it's question. City Park. Mr. Todd. Mr. Well, if I may, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor, it, we own the property, but we have a, a lease agreement with them. Uh, I guess it's just their feeling that uh, they come here and get the <clears throat> approval. We can certainly have a conversation with them and see if there's a better way to do it. Certainly, don't want to hold things up, but. On the other hand, I think I think they're used to that process because they've always done it that way, and they do have a lease for it. So, but it's certainly something we can take back and have a conversation with them. Oh, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Carried. Eleven point eight Lundy's Lane approval. Addition of uh, two people. Move uh, Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson. Are there any questions? All in, all those in favor? Anybody opposed? Carried unanimously. 11.9, uh, liquor license request. It's a feeling of council on 11.9. Uh, we should quite be happy to move the request. Move by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor yeah. Campbell. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. 11.10, Eaters Heroes. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Pardon? Yeah, Councillor? Moved by, moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. 11.11, .11, Hydro Canal. Nikola Tesla Power Canal. Who would decide the name? Who was the? Mr. Clerk. Yeah, the request came through. I think the councilor is just asking who would decide on that name. Uh, I was careful in my wording there just to make sure that council is aware that this is uh, owned and operated by the Ontario Power Generation Incorporated. Their request also went to OPG. Um, 
but it was also addressed to council and that's why it's on the agenda. Uh, my recommendation is just that it's for the information of council, but it's obviously the will of council. Received and filed. Received and filed by Councilor Campbell. Second by Councilor Strange. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. 11.12. A letter from Mr. Correspondence from Mr. Bacher. Uh, what is he asking us for? Councilor, Councilor Iannone? I guess I just want to say for that group who's watching, do we have that communication he's now saying we didn't have? Other than what he's provided with us? Did staff provide us with that? Mr. Clerk? Uh, the email that was received this morning from Mr. Bacher uh, did also go to all of council. I was asked to put it on the agenda. I thought it was appropriate to put it as a communication item and not attached to the bylaw. However, I did reply back to him to say that the four attachments that he refers to in his email were not included in the email that he sent me today. Um, I see during the meeting he's replied back to me to just say that uh, planning department should have received those. I'm not sure if staff, if we do have those on file or not. Um, might be appropriate for director of planning to comment. Mr. Hurdlewick. Um, Mr. Acting Mayor, <coughs> some of the communication which Mr. Dr. Bacher refers to that I've seen in the past, and I don't know whether those are the same four attachments that he alludes to in this email, uh, were draft letters from the ministry. However, they were not uh, in their final uh, letter that we did put on the council agenda. On June the 22nd, we had the Ministry of Natural Resources representatives in committee room two in City Hall. We sat down with them and went line by line uh, through the official plan amendment that's on the council agenda tonight, 128. Uh, so the ministry was there and they basically gave their blessing to every policy that's before council tonight. So it's my opinion that the ministry signed off through their participation and their acceptance of the uh, official plan amendment as revised and on the agenda tonight. Okay, Councillor Campbell. Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to the pl planner. Do we have that documentation? The four attachments? No, the... Uh, the uh, the amendment 128? The, the ministry agreeing with all the uh, recommendations. They sat at the table. That's all I can tell you. I was at the I, meeting. I wasn't there. I'm asking, do we have that on paper? Like, I, I, no, I didn't, I didn't get them to sign the paper before they left the room. No, I did not. Your, your Worship, I have serious concerns about what is being uh, conveyed to us with respect to uh, <coughs> Dr. Bacher's letters. And I'm of the mind that perhaps we might have thought differently had we had those uh, letters as part of our deliberation with respect to moving forward. And, uh, and I, I, I think that we at this point should ask for a, 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 an outside investigation into what's being suggested with respect to the uh, correspondence. I think that uh, this might change the entire project itself. And I would make that a motion. Um, Councillor Peter Angel. Just for clarification, can we try to understand so that we're, we're all of the same understanding? Yeah. What is being suggested? What is being suggested? Uh, your worship, I, I, well, I think what's being suggested is, is some serious uh, uh, considerations from these letters that we didn't have as part of our deliberation process. And if, if you want to think of, of uh, moving forward, uh, all that information should have been with us. And I, I have some serious concerns about the fact that there might have been some something that we need to know about. Just to that point, then, Your Worship, should we not hear from our planner to see whether or not he agrees? Sure. Oh, I, you know, I, I don't think that the, the concerns that are being expressed in these uh, uh, matters can be dealt with tonight by the planner. I think it's above and beyond that. We need to have outside uh, investigation. 
I firmly believe someone, somewhere, somehow has crossed a line. Uh, we have Councillor Iannone and then, well, first of all, Councillor, uh, he wants to address that. Alex, yeah. Mr. Hrlovich. Well, I take exception to the slanderous statements, actually, I guess, uh, libelous, libelous statements by Mr. or Dr. Bacher, suggesting that staff was doing something underhanded, that we're being secretive, that we're withholding information. Um, those are all unfounded statements and not valid. Um, this project has been subject to multiple public meetings, both in these chambers, outside of these chambers. Uh, the ministry's official letter was shared with this council uh, at the public meeting. Uh, we've met with the ministry staff. Um, you know, the fact that I'm reporting that to you tonight, the fact that certain councillors do not trust me to be honest with them is their opinion, uh, but I find that slanderous and, uh, and defaming. Sir, can I just ask a question? Like, are we supposed to vote for this ba based on the fact that uh, John Bacher says that we didn't receive information, or is there information that he has that he can give to us that he knows that we didn't receive? Because the two are very different. I mean, in one, it's just simply an allegation that we didn't receive all the information. And on the other side of it is, well, here's the information that you didn't receive. To me, it would be a world of difference in, in, in how I vote on this. Um, I mean, if it's simply an allegation saying you didn't receive all the information, then my gut is I'm going to have to trust that staff are honest and they gave me everything that was in their power to give me. If the other one comes true and I'm giving something that says you did not receive this, then I might have a different opinion. But until that time, I think I'd be inclined to support our staff, Your Worship. Councillor Iannone. I'll speak in the bylaws. Oh, well, we have a motion on the floor by Councillor Campbell. Councillor, would you, what, what, the well, motion? Uh, a pretty serious allegation. Yeah, uh, it, it's not a serious, I'm not, I'm not making any allegation whatsoever. I'm simply saying that the information that Dr. Bacher has provided us today, Just all of us have received that information. It leads me to believe that the outcome of that recommendation we met, made to move forward with Thundering Waters might have been different if we had a said, okay, let's wait and see what the outcome is going back to the ministry to see what their concerns really were. Investigate it further. That's, that's all I'm saying. And it would appear that we didn't receive that information. And the motion I make and is, is on the basis that we, we, we hire an outside source to look at the implications and, and uh, see how this moves through or not. Um, Mr. Todd wants to answer. Thank you, Mr. Ackermere. If I could try to take a bit of a crack at this. So at the, the meeting where council approved the recommendation, uh, there was 27, Alex, 27 it was, um, Conditions. conditions to be met. So you had all of the information you needed to make that night that was available to us. Since that time, staff and the planning consultants and the ministry have gone to craft up the wording to satisfy those 27 conditions. So the meeting Alex is referring to, there was ministry staff, regional staff, our staff, around a conference table working out the details of wording to be included in the bylaw to satisfy those 27 conditions. That's what's before you tonight uh, in, in that wording. So the ministry staff has sat at a meeting and, lack of better words, mediated that wording with our staff and with regional staff. So I don't think there's anything untoward here. Uh, we had to work through getting that you know, through those 27 conditions and getting that information back to you. Mr. Bacher is sitting outside of that process. So I don't know what information he's saying he has or doesn't have, but this is a process that you have to go through to get to the point where there may, may be a meeting with staff and consultants that are agreeing around that table that that's the language we'll bring forward. So I'm not sure where he's coming from on it. Uh, 
I think our staff has done the best job they can do to capture all of the findings and wording of all of those ministries and, and staff that sat around those meetings. Uh, and that's what's before you tonight. So um, I'm not sure how you know his sort of allegations play into this um, in terms of, because he wasn't part of that process. Councilor Peter, uh, I'm just ahead. saying, Your, your Worship, and I appreciate that, that uh, we might have made a, a decision in a different manner had that information been made available to us through the Ministry of National Resources. But I think, I, I help me out here again, I think it, the information when you made a decision, this is, this is wording that was uh, dealt with after you made your decision to satisfy those conditions. conditions. So this is the first time it's back to you. It's not like we get anything from you. It's just that the 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 wording and and satisfying those 27 conditions has gone. That process has gone on since you approved that recommendation. Perhaps those 27 recommendations would have been somewhat different had we had that those letters in our possession. And those letters were written to us prior to us making that decision. I'm sorry. We all got them. Well, I don't have them. Um, I received the email from today. I received the email from the city clerk. None came through. None came through. I don't know. Maybe I should speak uh, on the record because I haven't received these. Uh, I, I asked the city clerk whether or not they came through. He confirms that it, it says in the email that there's four attachments, but nobody has the attachments. So I'm not sure what it is that everyone else has seen. Uh, maybe I'm the only one that hasn't seen no, it. I maybe I can get some confirmation from others around the table that they haven't seen this either. Like I said to you, it would be a different story for me in, in deciding on how I vote, but I haven't seen them yet. Nope. So I don't have either. Mr. Uh, Acting Mayor, Alex? I haven't seen the attachments. I can speak to something near the bottom of his email where he says that there was a um, peer review done by a company called Northwest on the environmental impact study. And that was the first study that was done by um, the consultants while this was part of the city's official plan amendment, part of our secondary plan. Following that, the developer basically chose to go on her own and provide her own documentation. She redid the EIS. Based on some of the com comments that were made by North South, these are similar to, we get comments, for instance, the car wash you dealt with tonight. There were comments about servicing. That we passed on to the developer. He then worked with Jeff Holman's office to determine that the best way to deal with water was to take it out to Victoria Avenue. I didn't share that letter with you tonight. But that was comments that came from uh, um, from one of our departments specific to an application that we passed on to the developer so you could work out the details. We do this all the time. So there was an EIS, there was a peer review. As a result of that peer review, the EIS was done, it was redone, it was modified again. I would say it was modified at least four times before it reached, it went through the ministry and at the end of going through the ministry they sent their formal letter saying we still object to this, this, this and this. We outline those as possible modifications, part of the 27 which the uh, CAO just spoke to and then we wrote those into policy. We sat at the table on June 22nd to work those out with the ministry. So it's an iterative process. It didn't just be excuse me, mean that um, there was one comment and then the next comment and the next comment and they all stack up. They were refinements of previous um, things. The balance of the letters, I have no idea what he's talking about. Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have to say this. With Councillor Campbell is standing here talking about a concern he has, which we're supposed to do as councillors. This is our forum to do it. Um, I'm sorry that you take objection or offense or whatever it is that Mr. Bacher is, is uh, insinuating, but that's what you said. But it's our job to ask. So I, I'm, I'm confused. Well, he did. 
he asked about the letters that you did not receive and I don't need any attitude here I'm just commenting on Councillor Campbell's but I want to say at the bottom of the email that Mr. Bacher sent us is an attachment that I didn't see until tonight and I and it's his WordPress blog and it talks about the letters that Councillor Campbell it talks about the letters we didn't receive that are dated December 11th, 2017 and January 25th, 2018. And that they were both signed by a Tara, Ma a Tara McKenna, senior planner for the MNRF. And in it, she, it says that the April 30th document that we did get, in which we voted on, um, this Ms. McKenna alludes to the documentation we didn't get we didn't like the application we didn't vote for it we wanted all the answers there i think that was raised that evening too so i guess the question is can we have the letters dated those days uh, december 11th january 25th the letters that on april 13 april 30th she refers to as he's referring to it as suppressed documents not me can we have those to look at if i can i have no idea the letters yes, were Mr. Acting city. Mayor, I believe the councillor is asking for four letters. I will look to see if we have four letters. At this point, I'm still not sure what they are. Um, the fact that the councillor was able to activate her link on her iPad is one thing. I've tried to activate mine while I'm sitting here. Certainly, I'm not getting any response. So I have no idea what the four letters are. I believe the best thing would be for Mr. Bacher to supply those to the planning department, which are the city clerk rather, and the city clerk can distribute them to city council. Yeah. Yeah, and that's on the bottom of your links. It's I didn't see it either. It's teeny tiny. I can't open them. I don't know if anybody. Yeah, I this is this I couldn't open them before here, and, and now it's, it says WordPress, and all you do is press that, and it opened it to this whole document. So, like, I, I'm going to support your asking for the information because I I too think that we had everything in front of us maybe the the support may have been different i don't know but it's it's just simply asking for everything that we believe should have been provided it's to me it's just common sense mr clerk so i, I think part of the problem here is is mr bacher sending this uh the day of a council meeting it was sent this morning the letter the email that was sent this morning is part of your agenda um, it immediately was asked by staff if I could re-forward those attachments. My response was I wasn't able to open them. I replied back to Mr. Bacher for the attachments and now he has replied during the meeting to just say that planning department should have them, but if not, he can go ahead and send them. I also just want to point out that he, did, he was a public speaker at the uh, public meeting and that public meeting was deemed to have closed. Right. So council may want to consider that as well. Yeah. The feeling of council. The motion, on the floor. Is there a second? The motion well, yeah. uh, Councilor Cameron, your, your motion. motion. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll change that motion. To, uh, I would like to see those letters, have them uh, directly sent to council, and uh, we will use them for further information. Councilor? But I thought he already saw them. Oh, I, I, you haven't seen them. I haven't seen them, no. I haven't but either. Who's I seen haven't them? either. I'm just reading his blog. Whatever it's attached to the blog. Oh, I thought you said it's all there on the blog. Yeah, he's, he's highlighting the dates of the letters that he says we didn't oh, get. Oh, so the letters aren't there. No, and I just said oh, that. It's I December see. 11th. It's mm -hmm. June 25th. I'm sorry, January 25th, 2018. <clears throat> he's giving us the dates of the letters we did not receive. So my motion is that we receive those letters for future consideration. I will second that. For future consideration. So we have a motion on the floor by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Iononi, that we receive those letters. Recorded vote. Recorded vote? Mm -hmm. Whose letters are they? Uh, from who? The from NRF who? To the from city. the ministry. To the city. From the ministry to the city? Yes. What's wrong with that? If they're to the city, I'm fine with them. Yeah, to, the to the city. city. Okay. Okay. Uh, that, Mr. That's his concern. They were to the city and they weren't shared with us in the documentation. Mr. Clerk? Um, 
I believe I heard that it was asked for a recorded uh -huh. vote. There is a motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Iannone that staff, uh, or sorry, that Council received the MNRF four attachment letters referred to in Mr. Bacher's email uh, dated July 10th, 2018 uh, for future consideration. Uh, Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Crater. Yes. Councillor Iannone. Yes. Uh, Acting Mayor Curio. Yes. Councillor Peter Angelo. In favor. Councillor Strange. Yes. And Councillor Thompson. Yes. I just uh, don't like the atmosphere of accusations that's no, going that. around here. Yeah, right. That passes. Okay. Now what do we do? Move on. Move on. Okay. Uh, ratification of in camera. Uh, nothing to ratify an open council for that. Nothing to ratify open council. Uh, the bylaws. You need a motion to introduce the bylaws? Here? Motion to introduce the bylaws. So moved. Moved by Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Second by Councillor Strange. Can you pull bylaw 2018-76, please? Which one? I'm sorry, Councillor. 2000. 2018-76. Mr. Why? She just, she'd like to pull it. Well, no. Pull it. Oh. Like, you can ask a question. To it. You want to ask the question? Oh, go ahead. Ask the question, <laughs> Councillor. The consent agenda. Um, is there, and I'm trying to go through this, because we received an email, I received an email from somebody that said in, and I'm trying to read it as we're doing this, in the, uh, the bylaw we're passing tonight, are we agreeing to front end anything? Somebody from staff can answer that, I'd appreciate it. Who's gonna answer this question? Who wrote the report? Well, are we agreeing to front end? Are we agreeing to front, oh. are we agreeing to front end any part of this development? Mr. Hurdlevik, it's, it's part of your, one of That's your... That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, I, I can't say that we're agreeing to front any aspect of it. The, um, there may be policies in there that would provide for, at the time of subdivision development, that front-ending agreements could be entered into, but we're a long way away from subdivision agreements at this point. There would be a policy direction. If it's in the in there, I'd have to go through policy by policy. Okay, Councillor. Okay, and and at this point, can any clear cutting or any trees be cut or anything done at this point now on that piece of property? Mr. Um No, in fact, the wooded area that was of concern, there's a holding provision on that wooded area that they would need to do further studies. Uh, before they could uh, go in and do their any cutting, so they still they need to do the further studies and then get their permit from either the conservation authority or MNRF. And have Council. any of the um, they had 27 conditions. Have any of the conditions been been um, completed so far, Mr. Early? They weren't conditions as in a subdivision plan. They were modifications to the official plan policy so they were rewording of policies to accommodate the requests of Ministry of Natural Resources, the region and the Conservation Authority. So they were wording changes, wordsmithing. Okay. Council. Okay. So let's rewatch that video. And it was I will, some set around this table said, I will support this development because they have 27 conditions that they have to get through before anything can happen. And now they're not conditions, it's semantics and wording in, an in, in, a, in a phrase or a, a paragraph of a contract. That, that is absolutely not the impression given at the council meeting that evening. So what have they complied to? Mr. Todd, did you want to say something? I, I just wanted to, uh, Councillor, just, just to highlight uh, <coughs> further to Mr. Hurlovich, um, it's, it's 6.2 in the bylaw. It talks about front-ending agreements. What it, it sets out a policy that says Council 
may consider a front-ending policy, as Mr. Hurwitz said, in the future. Uh, so it's not saying we're doing it. It's just putting a policy here to say if council wants to do that in the future, the policy would be, a, be there to allow you to, to enter into such a can, can Can you just explain front-ending? Uh, it, 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 it might be front-ending of, uh, of servicing. Um, it might be front-ending of future roadworks. Does that mean we pay for it yeah. without collecting the money from them? So we are subsidizing it until, I, I just want to use the right wording. We are, well, we are financially front ending them money, um, services in kind until they can, I, I don't understand. Uh, it, or it could be a, a developer front ending certain services that we would recoup on the back end. Uh, so in other words, uh, they, they might front end a, an oversized sewer that would be collected uh, later through development charges or through Building developments perhaps that were beyond their boundaries that they could recover money from the next guy down there. So they can take different forms. Uh, Alex, I'm not sure, Jeff, which ones we've done in the past, but they, they can, come, can come in different different forms uh, for any Thank you, and maybe through you to, to um, Jeff, that Mr. Holman. Can you give me an example of when we've done that? Grand Niagara. Grand Niagara. Oh, that be right, Jeff? When we, when we did the remember. services? No. I don't remember that. Well, we uh, built a couple of pumping stations uh, in anticipation of growth in the south end, uh, where we we front ended and funded it fully from development charges. That was uh, ten point eight million. I, that uh, that was 10.8 million, if I remember correctly, because it was quite the discussion here. Uh, yes. Um, but and then we didn't end up getting that money. We, it ended up coming from us. No, we're getting it back. No, it's it's all being paid for by the development community. Okay. Because that's who it was built. That's the wrong. I'm not thinking. That's a difference. Yes. Okay. And the conditions, the conditions, the wording, the the semantics. What has been completed in the 27 ones they were supposed to? Mr. Hurley, the 27. They were recommend their conditions. They were recommendations for modifications to the official plan amendment. So those 27 wording changes were put in there. I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor, I don't have a copy of the report in front of me. I left it on my desk, not realizing the line of questioning that would occur tonight. I want to make it clear when we when we spoke on that that night, they were not ever called modification or word changes. They were conditions. I think Alex can go get it. Yeah, that's great. But they were not put to the public as as modification or word changes. They were conditions the developer had to had to complete before they could. Because everybody said, "Oh, we didn't pass anything. We have they have to wait till they complete their conditions." which makes it more onerous on the developer so that things are tighter and now they become word changes? I find that problematic. Well, he, <coughs> Mr. Erlovich is going to go get it and then we'll deal with it. Your Worship, if I could, while I was Mr. You know, some time ago I was quite impressed and this is when I first got on council. I was at a conference and uh, we all know Hazel McCallion and she was a fireball. But I remember she stood up once and said, don't tie uh, uh, recommendations up with words that you can't undo with your lips. And I'm really afraid that the passage of this bylaw tonight is committing us to something in the future that we might find we didn't realize that that is what we were doing. I'm afraid that somehow in this whole bylaw, it's going to come back and bite us. That's my concern. I want to see the bylaw come back that we passed last meeting, where they've passed all 27. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see this piecemeal. I want to see the whole thing, the whole package. But if we pass this, then we got a piece of this that snuck its way through, perhaps. And then the next time they come before council, it's another piece of information they're sneaking through. 
I want to see the whole thing in its entirety. I don't want to see bits and pieces like this tonight. And just, can I just piggyback something on that? I, I watched a regional council meeting last week where the discussion of the riverfront and what regional council's role in this was going to be. And I remember asking that night, when we pass this community plan, does this mean we are bypassing the secondary plan and it doesn't have to go to the region? And the answer was yes. Now the region's discussing what, what authority do we have and what, what <coughs> part in this application do we play in regards to approving anything. And I'm pretty sure I've rewatched that tape a couple times and it was the region had no bearing. And actually Mr. Herlovich said the region was not interested in getting involved at that time. So, uh, yeah, well, Mr. I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase you to give you that, but you can go back and watch it. Mr. Herlovich. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Acting Mayor, so the reading from the staff report, which was at Council on May the 8th, it says, staff is recommending approval of the pros, proposed official plan amendment uh, for the Riverfront Community Plan subject to the recommendations contained in this report. There were recommendations. There were 27 recommendations. So there was a area on endangered species and there was review of what the Ministry of the Natural Resources had to say. At the end of that, the recommendation was that Schedule G and <coughs> Schedule A1 be amended to illustrate the features of certain land uses. Schedule G be amended to illustrate certain habitat location. That the amendment be modified to require further studies to determine the extent of Blazing Star and Kentucky Tree. That the amendment be modified to provide policies. I don't know how more, much more specific we could be in that the report said there were recommendations, there were modifications and changes to the amendment that was presented in its draft form on May the 8th. We can't just write these in isolation. So we wrote drafts, we sent those to the Ministry of Natural Resources, we sent them to the Conservation Authority, we sent them to the region. We then invited all of them to submit their comments, which they did. We then met collectively on June the 22nd to prepare a document that you have before you tonight, which we're currently discussing, in which we took all of those recommendations and wordsmithed the document so that we could provide the best amendment for you tonight. If council adopts it tonight, then the um, anybody who is opposed to that will receive notice and can appeal it. Anybody who, um, if council chooses not to adopt it tonight, then I suppose the developer can appeal. Um, that's what council has in front of it tonight. It has a document that staff put its best efforts in, working with the agencies that commented on this. The report definitely says recommendations, and it speaks to modifications. That's all I can say. Okay, can, I, well, can we suggest we pull that bottom and vote on it separately? Sure, can I just? Yeah, go ahead. And I just wanted to add one last thing to what Alex has said, just, just to make it clear. So at those, that process that happened since the last council meeting and having all of those people in the room, the document before you, all of those agencies, regardless of what these letters dated, whatever Mr. Bacher's talking about, those agencies were in the room signing off on this document that you have tonight. So I don't know what those letters may or may not have said, but representatives from MNR region, Conservation Authority, their planning consultants, our staff, were in that room, as Alex said, wordsmithing this document to get it in front of you tonight. So there should be no secrets with M and R or whoever else. I don't know what those older letters that were dated a couple months say, but they came to the table working out the wording in this document. So that's what's in front of you tonight. So um, I agree with Alex, the documents here, staff have done a, 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 a good job to get it here. Um, 
it's in front of council and, and we're recommending that, you know, in accordance with the, the, with the previous decision that you go ahead and approve this tonight. Can I just, just for clarification. Can we pull that bylaw and vote on it separately? Because we can argue all night. Okay, guys, council. I'm not gonna argue, I just wanna ask a question. Does yeah. that mean that, that everybody around that table feels the 27 recommendations, conditions, modifications, or word changes are complete and they can go ahead? That, that's my understanding coming out of that meeting. So obviously. approving this, they can move forward starting tomorrow? Uh, well, there's still other processes that have to come back to you. You have a subdivision process, you have a whole bunch of subdivision and servicing plans, and these are other approvals that will be back. This is just really the first phase because you've got zoning amendments, you've got subdivision plans, uh, these are just the OP documents. Okay, so the 27 recommendations are complete. When we approve tonight, what can they start to do tomorrow? They can start uh, meeting with our staff to get the subdivision plan done, the zoning bylaw amendments done, uh, what other, other documentations need to come back to this council. Uh, I think our staff are meeting later this month on pre-consultation. Uh, with respect to the subdivision uh, subdivision layout. So that those are the next immediate phases that they have to get on. Okay, thank you. Are you separating this? I, a, I would had you asked like that one pulled and dealt with separately? Yeah, let's vote on that separately. Can we not do that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't see why that's what I'd we'll like to. We'll vote on all the others first and, and okay. vote on that one. So uh, we pull that one. Uh, yeah, if you want to just make a motion to uh, give you give bylaws. Make a motion to pull it. You just say opposed to. Pardon me. Whichever one you're opposed to. Right. You could. Yes, you could just say you're opposed to that bylaw. But can I? I'd like it pulled and voted on separately. Can I do that? That's motion. I don't see why you can't. Okay. Thank yep. you. We I did it tonight motion. for for the acting mayor. Well, yeah, we need a seconder to your motion. I move it. Second by Councillor Campbell that we pull that one vote on separately. So then, can we deal with the rest of them first? We've already got a motion on the floor for all yep. the bylaws, do we not? Except for that one. Except for that one. Second and third? Pardon me? That one was not separated. Okay. Then we have to have a vote to separate it? Is that what you're suggesting? It's, it's not a consent agenda. Right. You don't just pull a bylaw. Well, your clerk is saying we can't. By way of motion, you can. He can just, she made a vote. Oh, we, we have to vote on the motion then. Are there any questions that, regarding the motion to pull that bylaw? All those in favor of pulling that bylaw? Opposed? Okay, so we're going to pass the bylaws as a whole? Right. I'd like it recorded, please. Okay. Your Worship, I'd like to speak one. First. Sure. Go ahead. The, the information that uh, Mr. Todd just uh, revealed, somehow I can't believe that those 27 recommendations have been all met. I mean, uh, Morocco, Councillor Morocco isn't here, but she voted on it because she felt that it would take a long time for those recommendations to be moved through. And I get the impression, and I don't think anybody around Council knew till that comment was made by Mr. Todd, that basically uh, Councillor Iannone said, are we front-ending anything with the passing of this bylaw? And we are front ending. We're giving them the 100% goal. No, we're not. No, no, no. That's what he said. No. I mean, they got to come back to us for subdivisions and all that. There's but still, this is the this would be like we're at first base. They've got a number of other processes to go for. You, what you're doing tonight is you're approving the official plan amendment that that allows you to move to the next phase. It doesn't give you carte blanche to go out and do it. There's going to be multiple uh, meetings and documents that are going to be coming back to this council. The 27 uh, items that Mr. Herlovich talked about were items that needed to be uh, clarified and, and the wording uh, detailed to get this document to you tonight. That's, that's what the work that's been undertaken over the last m month and a half. I guess that further emphasizes the need for all of us to have seen those documents prior to us making a final decision on 
the motion that's before us tonight. That's my biggest concern because we may have moved as a council differently. And, and I'm saying we don't, we don't have all the information to pass this bylaw tonight to move it forward because that basically says it's moving forward. But, but if I may, Councillor, there may have been a letter from M&R that, that, that today may have no meaning because their staff have come to the and table. And there may not be, but that the, they may, may have meaning. But I'm saying the experts that are signing off on having this document here are the ones that are saying we're satisfied with I it. I don't even know if the people from the Minister of Natural Resources were even aware of those letters themselves. The ministry is a huge organization. But the staff were in the meeting. But the staff don't, don't have those letters. Well, I don't uh, know which letters they are. <clears throat> well, yeah. we have a motion on the floor for the bylaws. If someone wants to vote against a particular bylaw, they vote against a particular bylaw. Am I not correct, Mr. Clerk? It, uh, you just asked for a motion uh, yeah. to introduce the bylaws, those being 2018-71 to 2018-88. Right. That's... And I ask for a reported vote. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, motion to introduce the bylaws. Yep. You can get a first or seconder? Yeah, I'll introduce them. Yeah, moved by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange. She asked for a recorded vote. Okay, the motion uh, by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, is to introduce the bylaws 2018-71 to 2018-88. Motion's been, been made. All right, uh, Councillor Campbell. Opposed. I'm sorry, we're passing them, right? We're introducing, we're introducing them, introducing that's the motion. The that's the motion yeah. that's always been done at this yeah, council. But they passed. They haven't been passed. They haven't even been introduced yet. And then they'll be read a first time. A second time. And, and then a second passed. and third time it passed. Yeah. Yeah. If I may. Can I just interrupt? Yep. Uh, yep. I can just interrupt for one second. So the difficulty we have here is that we're having a recorded vote, a recorded vote on a motion to approve all of the bylaws before right. you. Well, because the other one failed. Well, they wouldn't let me pull it. So if we are now voting, I uh, just point out, Councillor, you, you've indicated I'm voting no. It means you're voting no to yes. every bylaw. All the bylaws. Well, that's the only option that's easy. You, can, you, can, you can be recorded as opposed to a certain bylaw. You could be opposed to bylaw, whatever number. That's what Victor said. You, you don't have to oppose all of them. I said that. Yeah. I don't want to stand up and say I'm opposed to this bylaw. That's it. All right. Okay. So can we back up? The, the we back up and, and just. Do the bylaws, and if you're opposed to a bylaw, vote against the bylaw. <clears throat> so all that being said, once the motion is introduced, the acting mayor will then ask uh, if there are any questions or comments of council. Can he ask for a recorded vote on 2018-76? Yeah, we, well, we'll have a recorded vote on all of the bylaws. Tonight. No, that's what Mr. Todd just didn't want. And I, I would suggest that you indicate your opposition to that specific bylaw, 201876. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, to introduce the bylaws 201871 to 201888. Councillor Campbell. I'm opposed to 201876. I'm going to back up just a little bit as to what the CAO stated. Right now, we're just introducing the bylaws. We're not voting on them. There's just a motion to introduce them. Once that's completed, the mayor will then say if there are any questions or comments, and if you're, if council is all in favor, that would be the appropriate time to make any opposition. It would have been a lot easier. We just withdrew. <laughs> I did give advice to the chair that that could be done. Too. Okay, so motion to introduce the bylaws, 2018-71 to 2018-88. Councillor Campbell? Why would we have a recorded vote on this if we're just introducing the bylaws? Because a motion was passed to have a recorded vote. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, and it, Mr. Todd stood up and said then vote recorded on the 2018. So all we're doing is introducing it. Now I'll remove that and let's just vote on the introduction. All in favor? And we have a motion. We have a motion. <laughs> 
by Councilor no, Peter Angel, second by so Councilor Strange. We, we introduce the bylaws. Yet. All in favor? Carry it unanimously. Okay, so <laughs> bylaws 2018-71 to 2018-88 have been read a first time. Second, uh, second and third by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange. Any questions? All no. those in favor? No, wait a second. That's what I'm going to oppose. They just want to be shown opposed. Opposed to 2018-76. Correct. And yourself as well. Yes. And Crater Anybody as well. Anybody else? Nope. I'm not going to stop anything for Dr. Barker. Anyway. So I, sorry, I have oppositions then from Councilors Iannone, Crater, and Campbell. Right. On that. Uh, just for bylaws 2018-76. Right. Okay, so the motion was made. So 2018-71 to 2018-88, read a second and third time. All those in favor? Absent. Carried. The rest? Carried. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And passed. The passed. Are we done with it? We're done. <laughs> but, uh, just a point of order. Um, it wasn't a recorded vote. It did pass. Uh, it passed with a vote of three to three. And according to the rules of uh, uh, order, if that motion fails. No, there were only three in opposition. Right. Well, there's when only you three do the, voting for it. The, uh, the mayor counts as a vote. No, uh, he can't vote. He, he can vote. He can vote at a time. He can, he, can he can vote at any time, and he can vote to break a tie. Okay. Uh, there was no opposition, so therefore, the he's in favor. For this? Yes. Okay. New business. Anybody have any? Anybody have any new business? Councillor Thompson. Um, anyway, there's so much time in between meetings. Uh, this st stuff builds up. Uh, I'm going to have to take uh, thirty pieces. Huh? You got thirty. Councillor Peter Angelo's turn uh, this time. Anyway. Um, first of all, uh, I think you've all been made aware of the billboard that went up on uh, Lundy's Lane. Uh, maybe you can put it up on uh, the screen. There, there it, is. it is there. Uh, this is the Regional Health Department uh, putting up a sign. Uh, info dying is mandated by the uh, provincial government to uh, have online information about uh, problem properties, uh, swimming pools uh, that are checked by the health department, whatever. Uh, the acting um, medical officer of health uh, tried to defend this by saying, oh, this is mandated. And I responded and said, online is mandated. Uh, billboards with people fearful uh, faces uh, and indicating about restaurants in Niagara Falls is not mandated. Anyway, uh, after many uh, emails back and forth and complaints from the uh, people in the industry where they're, everybody's spending millions of dollars to uh, support the destination and we have our regional health department uh, putting up signs like this that uh, are trying to uh, have a negative impact on uh, eating in restaurants in Niagara Falls. I thought that this was so out of line and disgusting and the uh, health department uh, tried to defend that initially and then when the regional chair, everybody else got involved, uh, they backed off and uh, the sign is coming down. But uh, I really think we have to have a report back how this happened, what was their objective. Could anybody not realize a sign like that from the health department regarding restaurants uh, is not going to have a positive, positive effect uh, on uh, what's happening in Niagara Falls or any place else. 
apparently there are three of these signs up throughout the region. Um, who's paying for them? Uh, you know, they're, they're always complaining about the budget and the health department budget. And uh, I think we have to have a report back uh, on this. Um, <laughs> I was with the health department uh, for most of my life uh, working there. Uh, things have changed so much. They've cut back on so much of their work that used to be done regarding rats, uh, cockroaches, bed bugs. Uh, the, all they do now, they send you out a brochure. And I told this to the regional chair uh, yesterday. I said, this is unacceptable. No wonder we have a rat problem like we have. Anyway, uh, the sign's coming down. I would like a report back how it happened and some of the comments uh, regarding the services that are being supplied by the health department now, which are totally inadequate. So motion by motion. Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Strange that staff gets a report back to us. All those in favor? You carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, where did Mr. Todd go? He uh, had to have a break, I think. Said only one new business. Okay. Do you need him? Um, there he is. Okay. Um, Can't go to the washroom until we're done. We're, we're having uh, a, a lot of debate uh, uh, with respect to uh, parking lots. Uh, maybe you're the guy to talk to anyway. Um, and I, we seem to have a double standard now. Uh, they were out uh, trying to tell all the parking lots to bring in Victoria Center up to uh, standard and uh, uh, some of the best parking lots that had been approved in the past were told they had to make major changes and um, all of a sudden we said okay we're not going to do it this year we'll do it uh, make sure you everybody's going to have to uh, comply for next year. And in the meantime, there's some other parking lots that have uh, come forward. Uh, they have put, uh, applied for a permit. They've set uh, a site plan. They're not completed, but they have the, uh, the, uh, the lot all cleaned up. Uh, the one I'm talking about specifically is on Stanley Avenue. And uh, the, uh, they've been told you can't use that as a parking lot. So how do you say to one, uh, we're gonna give you to next year, and another one that comes on, I think we got a double standard. We have to deal with these and uh, come up with uh, solutions so we can always use more parking lots. Uh, do you have a? I, well, I can comment on that to you, Mr. Akimir. The position we took it was that there was a number of existing parking lots that um, we wanted to bring up to standard. And uh, we said to them, we'll give you uh, a grace period this year, uh, but next year in the 2019 licensing period, you've got to be compliant, which means proper drainage, lighting, paving. The, um, the existing one still had to get a license for this year. Any brand new parking lot that came on. I think that's what you're referring to. It's not a parking lot that existed ever before. No. We said the new standard should apply this year. So, so you do have a double standard. No, because the we don't have a double standard because we said any anybody new had to comply. We gave the existing people because they they had never been forced in the past to comply with the new standards and were already operating. It wasn't enough time for this season to get all of that work done. So that's why uh, we said, if you're coming in with a brand new application, we're gonna be dealing with you under the brand new standards. So um, so you're letting uh, the existing ones off the hook that don't comply, but the ones who are coming in and trying to get started, uh, you're, you're not saying, well, you can have a period uh, until next year to meet the bylaw and the standards. And I think the thinking was they're starting from scratch. So they're, they're brand new, it's a brand new lot. So yeah. the feeling was they should Have comply. Have you looked at it? 
I, I'm not even looks, sure where it is. But, it's on Stanley but, Avenue, right behind. But that's the position. That's, that's the position we were taking. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, what, rather than get into all that, I would make a motion that uh, you look at uh, um, the one in particular on Stanley, where I've been harassed about it, uh, to uh, see if there was something that they can do to have some uh, support. What they have to do, they've applied for a permit, they've uh, put a site plan in, what they want to do, and they're working to upgrade it and make it happen. So may maybe they just uh, need a little uh, guidance on how to accomplish that. Well, if I may, Michelle, yeah, I think if, if I, I'll just say, if we're going to have a motion, I think we'd rather from staff get direction to say that regardless of whether it's an existing, by -law, existing lot or a new lot, that all of the new regulations come into 19. That would that would be. Yeah, the you can't pick and choose. Pardon me. I think it would be better, better than picking and choosing. That's what you're suggesting. Yeah, and that I and that's a that's the direction we'd be looking for. I would just forewarn you that you do realize that we had a fair amount of pressure from the BIAs right. to make sure we clean these things up. So well, well, and and I was sitting there at the same time, along with uh, yeah. whenever. Uh, the acting mayor wasn't in Vegas. Uh, he was out <laughs> there. But all uh, the parking lots of Vegas. But are if paved. that is the motion, you still have to remember that they do still have to get a license for this year. The, so there will be there will be certain they, things that they yeah. still need to comply with, but they yeah. will need to get a license. It may not mean that they have to be paved and all that, if that's what you're getting at. But no. if that's what the motion of council well, is, well, then there's a lot of them that aren't paved. The, the old Casadora one. Uh, uh, th th they don't comply. But, that, but that's where we had said any existing lot has to fully comply by uh, May of next year. Yeah. Okay. So why wouldn't you... Uh, Mr. I think Mr. Trent wants to comment. Okay. Yeah. If I could just comment. So uh, when we look at some of the new ones that are coming in, they're, for lack of a better word, they're handing us a plan on a clean end. In other words, there has to be a proper plan, uh, a proper drawing, because all the, the majority of the existing ones have done that. They mm -hmm. went out, got hired architects, they've hired the people to do it, and a lot of these are coming in on hand-drawn, and we don't accept that, because it's, it's, we don't have property lines, we don't have anything that we can say, is that, is that land on their property? Okay. So I, I think that there has to be some sort of standard set to say, if they submit the proper plans, and and it's reasonable yes we sh we could approve them but if they're just coming in and say hey i, I have a piece of land i want to you know put parking here that's a different well, story right do you know the one on stanley avenue I, i'm not familiar no. I, i'm not so familiar so how, how no no i'm saying in how general how do you know what's on kleenex i'm not i'm not saying what that how are you talking no i'm sorry i i'm not saying that i'm saying a lot of the lots all are i'm asking in. you to treat everybody the same way and if they come in and they do things properly, submit the proper plans, what's the problem? You've already given the other people the same benefit. So we just, I, we just, staff would, if that's the case, staff needs a motion here because we had a previous report about three months ago before this council that said otherwise. It said, impl it said enforce no, the rules. It, no. Yes, it, it did. Said, what it said uh, is given until 2019. It, existing lots. The, it, it, so I, I think we need a motion to clarify that if council well, is saying it's any lot gets the grace until 19, we're fine with that, but that's different than what we had reported before. What's your comments? I didn't bring this up. <laughs> you need a motion if you want to include them, but I, I understand what Mr. Dren is suggesting that they have to be. They have to have the proper plan. They have to be working yeah. to comply and do the proper drawings. I was told they did do that, and they applied for a permit. If they haven't, then they have to do that. They have but to I comply. Looked at the, I went out and looked at the lot, and it looks as good as uh, the one on, in uh, Casadora. It's all, uh, it's not asphalt. Uh, How would you suggest we do this then? Well, I think what the councilor is saying is that they, first they of all, they have to give proper plans and yeah. they have to get a license. So they have to go through that process. If you're saying that 
for a lot like that that will not comply with paving and proper drainage and all that that you're saying as long as they've got the proper plans and get a license that and they, they will be the timeline they will be like other existing lots where they must comply by the next licensing period which would be may of 2019 then we would treat them all the same if that's if that's what that would be what your motion would be. But I understand what Mr. Dren is suggesting. He's suggesting that we would have to have an application on file that meets all the criteria. That the, there's going to be this much green, there's going to be this much asphalt, there's going to be this signage, there's going to be everything has to comply. And I think he's suggesting that some of them have not submitted the proper application with the proper design. Well, that's, I'm so, and I'm, so and I, I'm not suggesting, and I don't think you're suggesting that we bend that rule. That if everything else they is have in to compliance, co comply with the site. So similar to the ones and, and that we have yeah. grandfathered for yeah. another year. Yeah. Yes. It's comparable to yeah. the one well, that's Casadora. If you have a motion, then you need a, we need a second. Yeah. I, I make the motion that we try to comply, get these people to comply, and, uh, and give them the opportunity to operate. That's all. Well, Vice Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Strange. Are there any comments or questions pertaining to this motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, I, I hate to say this, but uh, Airbnbs, um, I don't know how many phone calls everybody gets uh, every day and how many emails we have to look at. But um, there seems to be uh, emails going out from City Hall indicating that, uh, oh, we're looking at this again, we're going to have a debate and a discussion on this again, and there's an opportunity for a change. Uh, I thought we went all through that. And now we're, we're suggesting, uh, you know, maybe I, I want to make one change if it does come back. I want to make sure we don't have managers in air in uh, vacant uh, vacation rentals or uh, even bed and breakfast. Uh, as soon as you have a manager, uh, you're going to get uh, they're all going to be Airbnbs because you'll drop in and drop out, and uh, it isn't going to work. We've never had any trouble with uh, bed and breakfast, but. I, th there seems to be some kind of uh, encouragement that this is going to change, that uh, the emails going out are suggesting that uh, maybe the council is going to be more lenient with this. And you've heard this, the association people that were here saying, we don't care what you do, we're going to carry on in residential areas. and. Uh, it's a, it's just a mess out there, Mr. And I don't know how your uh, bylaw enforcement people uh, uh, deal with this. It's just a constant, everyday, uh, serious problem that we're, we're going to take us years to bring under c control. Well, if I may, see you, Mr. Rector, I, I I I honestly don't know where that message is coming from. Uh, I at the last I think, meeting. I think it's Alex. Well, at the last meeting, the same issue was raised. We specifically spoke to uh, Mr. Spencer. He assured us that that is not the messaging they're giving out of their office. Um, they are taking addresses and basically saying, we'll get to them when we can get to them, but there's so many of them we're, we're getting done. Um, but the only thing that has come back to this council is we said we'd report back on the fee and I guess the issue over manager versus uh, owner-occupied uh, that was, uh, I think, uh, in the motion of council. Those are the only two issues we need to come come back with. But Mr. Hurley, I think what Councilor uh, Thompson is referring to is that I think it was in May I met with two representatives from um, Airbnb. <coughs> Excuse me. They had gotten in touch with the mayor's office, and I met with them as a result of that. They suggested that. Um, the city's approach was was too narrow, and that we should be looking at some other opportunities. 
I said to them, if you have some other opportunities, bring those, send those in to me, and I will share them with council. I believe that's what Councillor Thompson is referring to. Um, I then many, got, I many, then got a, a how many very, emails have you had back and forth with the same people about the same topic? I got a very brisk comment back from all, uh, Councillor Thompson saying, "No way, council dealt with it. We've made our decision." I wrote to them and said, "I'm dealing with writing the bylaws that council directed that we write, a bed and breakfast in all the residential zones and vacation rentals in GCTC and CB zones." That's where it stops, as far as I know. Anyway, if I, I may too, if, if we, the two new bylaw officers started this week, so now we're up to full complement. Uh, one of their priorities would be going to be getting out. They're working different shifts, so there's time that they can visit in the evening hours. So um, we're up to full staff. Okay, I just I appreciate that, and and all I'm trying to do is not give these people the idea because it, I see it every day. Oh, the council is going to deal with this again. Uh, it uh, looks like, and people are sending emails to, to us saying, uh, you people already made a des decision. Are you going to change your mind now? Anyway, that's my concern. Anyway, I express my opinion on that, and uh, um, I certainly no. wouldn't uh, give any Motion. Motion. What, what kind of motion do you want to make? That's a, you know, there we've already made the decision, but I oh, said something about the managers. Oh, um, do we want to do that now, or when Alec comes back with all of the, his recommendations for change? <laughs> no, <he's coming> back. <laughs> I mean, he's drafting a bylaw now, so yeah. Well, I, I would make a motion that we we it's not a, a manager. Uh, that's going to be in charge of bed and breakfast. It's got to be the owner occupied. Your Worship, I can't support Councilor that. Councilor Campbell. Um, absolutely, I can't support that only because I'd like to see what Mr. Hurwitz is bringing back and then consider the manager. You might be throwing a monkey wrench into the whole thing. I'll, I'll, I'll second his motion. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we have a motion on the floor by Councilor Thompson that. Yeah. That we include that in the uh, Alex includes that in the, the uh, recommendations in, in the recommendations. No manager in It has to be an owner. Is that yeah. what you suggest? It has to be an owner, not yes. a manager. Yes. Owner, -occupied. owner occupied. Yeah. Second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor. Opposed. Councillor Campbell opposed. Okay. So we beat you on that one too. Anyway, <laughs> you're um, keeping scores. You're losing. <laughs> um, some time ago, I brought up about a report passed by council regarding the uh, trees over on somebody's uh, adjacent property, a senior, uh, somebody that didn't have the ability to, and I asked for a report to see what other municipalities, if there is any. Uh, ideas that could help some of these people out. I've had a couple of calls this week saying, where's that report? Uh, well, what did you do about it? Uh, I heard you talking about it. I was interested. Uh, is that coming back soon? Or well, if I may, you Mr. Mayor, the uh, staff was doing some research on it. Um, it was kind of falling under uh, the uh, solicitor's area, so I'm just not sure when we'll get that report back to you. Probably, okay. probably won't be before the end of the term. Okay, that's uh, at least that's noted. And, it's on. Yes. Yep. Okay, fine. The other thing is, um, um, I was approached about uh, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion uh, 396 in Chippewa. Uh, they just did. Uh, a major renovation in the lower area and uh, they have uh, approached uh, a couple of people and uh, also came back to me to see if the uh, city would uh, contact them and see if we can assist financially in a lift up and down for the uh, uh, seniors in the uh, Legion in, in the Chippewa area to see if uh, there is some 
financial incentive to get them up and down uh, from this area because all they got are the stairs and they're finding that a lot of people can't get up and down the stairs. So um, I refer I to staff. Make, you want me? to refer that one to staff? I just want to refer that to staff to see if they could contact them. And uh, I think they were they're looking for something as support. There might be money available uh, somewhere up, for that. Up to ten thousand yeah. dollars or something. Could be. Yeah. Refer to staff. We could, we can put them in touch, for example, with Sleep Cheap and get them the applications yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Crater. I refer that to staff to see if we can help them. Yeah. All in favor? Okay. Carried okay. unanimously. Okay. okay. Uh, other new business. Councillor Strange. That was a long one there. Councillor Thompson. You have to. Anyways, I realize, uh, Mr. Actamira, we don't have a, uh, a meeting until uh, August 14th. And I just want to bring up a special event that's coming up August 11th that we hold every year. Uh, uh, the Heaters Heroes Committee is along, along with the Falls View Hose Brigade. Um, it's our eighth annual Heaters Heroes Run for Children at Oaks Park, Saturday, August 11th. Um, we have uh, eight children, and basically uh, our mandate is to, uh, to fund uh, children and have uh, children walk or run or cycle around the park who have uh, terminal illnesses or life-altering illnesses or injuries. Um, like I said, it's our eighth year. We've helped almost 100 children in our Niagara region. Um, we've helped a, a lot of kids, and um, this year we have uh, a lot of celebrities coming out. We have bands. We actually have <coughs> Anthony DiCarlo's Niagara Rock Academy coming in there playing during the day, so it gives a chance of uh, kids that never played before in their musical instruments to come out and showcase their talent. And it's a community event. It's for free. Um, we've had uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, special uh, uh, children in Niagara Falls last year, Alex Louie was our, one of our Heaters Heroes last year. He couldn't attend, but we, uh, he was out of, uh, out of the city. But we helped uh, spear end uh, uh, a special moment where he got to, uh, got to meet Alex Ovechkin. And, uh, and we made that wish happen. We are like a small wish foundation. And uh, Alex got to uh, have his dream of meeting uh, Alex Ovechkin. And Alex promised uh, he would score for Alex uh, Louie. And he actually scored a hat trick. And then he ended up uh, winning the Stanley Cup so I, I think uh, it was such a special uh, connection that we kind of made that happen. So this year, uh, we have eight children, and one of our children went through the same operation as Alex Louie, a special uh, young teen girl from Toronto. And um, she had the, the exact same operation as Alex Louie, which is a, uh, a rotation plasty, where they remove uh, the, the bottom part of their leg and, and put the ankle back on, so they, they backwards on the knee, so they can continue to play sports. And uh, her name is, uh, the young teen is Emma Nigu. And she will be walking her final lap this year with young Alex Louie. And who knows, maybe if uh, Ovechkin gets a hold of what we're doing, maybe he'll come and uh, bring the Stanley Cup, which would be really nice. But at, anyways, we would love uh, every year we have uh, celebs walk a lap with some of these children. And um, like I said, uh, the funding goes towards them as well as uh, um, Heartland Forest, who rides his, his train, and Councillor Crater has, has driven his train. I think you have a, a, your special license for that train, which I, maybe you can come out for that day. But our first, uh, our first lap uh, is going to be at um, approximately 12:30 uh, p.m. on August 11th, and we would love our celebs this year, like we do every year, is to have our our city councilors and our regional councilors. We would love for you, regional council of Valpatty, to come out and support these children, as well as senior staff. So. We would love to support um, with golf stays in the community, Heartland Forest, and, and helping these directly to these young children who are fighting for their lives. And I want to mention one other uh, one that we uh, we helped last year was Julianne Misk, um, who's a special girl. And um, I think Councillor Peter Angel is going to speak about that in a second. But um, th these are the type of kids that we uh, we love for you people to come out and support and help. It's a community event. It's totally free. We just basically go on donations for people coming. So if you can please support that, I'd appreciate it. Great. New business? Councilor Crater? Go ahead. Just, yeah, I only have one item. Um, last council meeting I brought up, this is due with the rural area, and, and uh, I brought up the subject of the street light. And I just want to uh, thank Mr. Holman uh, 
they had a chance to look at it and deemed it was a safety issue and we were able to put up a light that was great for the residents out there. But because of that, um, I had a couple calls from some other people in the rural area that have some issues, uh, safety issues about street lights. And one of the questions that was asked to me, and I shared this with, I already shared it with Mr. Holman, but and I'd like him to comment on it, but they wondered what if the pole's already there and they're willing to buy the street light and they're willing to have it put up, but of course the city's got to put it up. And they were asking me the question, what if that approach was taken by some of the residents who feel strongly that there should be a light there? And Mr. Holman, can you just share what you shared with me when, when I spoke to you? I can't. Oh, I'm sorry, Camaro. What I uh, uh, spoke to Mr. Council Crater about was the fact that we do have a policy. It uh, was developed in 2012. Um, it doesn't have uh, those provisions for a cost-sharing opportunity, and it really needs to be looked at again. I'd like to bring it back to you uh, early in the new uh, term of council to allow for something like that to happen. Um, I did share with him that uh, we have a list of about 75, 76 streetlight locations that uh, really should be in place now that do comply with the, uh, the uh, policy but don't have funding in place. Um, and so maybe that will be an item that we can bring together at capital budget time. So having said all that, what I wanted from the council to consider, the one request that I did receive, and it's from uh, Mr. Ron Gennario, and it's out on Schistler, and I was out to take a look at it. Um, maybe we could just, uh, maybe through a motion, I just ask staff to, to take a look at that. And, okay. And, and they're quite willing to do cost sharing. I know we don't have the policy, but we could take a look at it to see if it might fit. So, um, Second Jeff by Councillor Peter Angelo. Before I make it, Mr. Holman, is that, does that cause you any, any concern if I make that motion? Or no. Okay, I'm just, that's the way I am. Uh, I'll make that motion. Then. It was seconded by Councillor. Yeah. Councillor Thompson. Well, I was going to second the motion, but uh, I had the same conversation. And the uh, gentleman on Schistler uh, was willing to uh, buy the, the light and just have the city, the pole is already there, and it's a real safety issue. It's black out there. People like to walk on the road at night, and uh, it's really dangerous. So uh, I support uh, what's going All on. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just have two items. Uh, first one stems from a public open house that happened last week. I know Councillor Crater, Councillor Strange was there as well. Uh, there's a development that's looking to go forward in Chippewa. Um, the meeting was held downstairs in committee room two and there was a lot of people from Chippewa there. Uh, their biggest concern was surrounding traffic and it was in the area of Lions Creek and Sodom Road. Now I don't really believe that either one of those streets fall under our jurisdiction. I think that they're both regional roads. So I wanted to ask staff, what do we do to get ahead of this? Because, um, I mean, according to the residents out there, there's already a problem with, with traffic. A lot of times people can't turn left uh, from Sodom Road uh, to head west onto Lions Creek Road. Uh, there really is only one road in to Chippewa from the highway. So there's a steady stream of cars that come down there all the time. There's more and more development that is happening out there in terms of new subdivisions. Uh, I believe there's um, a plot of land right now that is going through a secondary plan of subdivision. Uh, Mr. Herlovich might know about it, um, but I, I, I think they're looking at adding another, I want to say 700 homes out there. Um, that's only going to exacerbate the problem. That doesn't even touch on the uh, proposal that everyone was there to talk about. And I don't think the residents know about that secondary plan coming forward either. So I think what I'm asking staff is what can we do, even though we don't have jurisdiction over the roads, to get ahead of the game? We really need to do something at that intersection so that traffic flows, especially traffic that's coming um, on Sodom Road heading north to Lions Creek. They need to be able to turn left or right and not uh, start to queue on top of each other because then there becomes a long line of cars. So I don't know if staff have given it any thought. Um, I like traffic circles. The only problem with traffic circles is that, you know, it's not, it, it, they're not very pedestrian friendly in the sense that cars never really come to a stop. 
Uh, and I know that there would be people that would be crossing the road trying to get to the riverfront or trying to get to the Chippewa Creek. So um, I guess staff. I'll let, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'll get a comment from staff, but essentially I'd, I'd like to see us kind of come up with a plan for what we're going to do with that traffic intersection and either present it to the region or um, somehow uh, convince them to move forward with some changes because we need to make some changes there. Carl? Through the acting mayor, uh, typically what we would do is, is have a, count, uh, a resolution come from council asking them, uh, staff, to, to look at the intersection, uh, bearing in mind the future development that's going to happen there. Um, and I think when you said traffic signals, I think you meant stop signs, right? Well, they, they don't stop use stop right now. traffic signals. They would have to. They would have to stop, right? They wouldn't go through the traffic. Signal. No, what I said was uh, a traffic circle. Oh, circle. Um, yeah, circle. Sorry. Circles are good because they keep yes. all cars moving. Yes. Uh, and I never see a queue like over on Mountain Road. Yeah. The problem with it though is um, it's not the most pedestrian friendly. No, it's That's not. what I find. It, it's hard for people to get across because the cars never actually come to a stop. So that, that's correct. Usually, what happens with the traffic circle is you separate the, you try to separate the pedestrians out. So what you'd have the pedestrians do is walk further down down um, uh, Lions Creek and and cross at a kind of like a mid block section. I see. If there's a lot of if there's a lot of pedestrians. So uh, you know, traffic circle is one of the one of the things that you try to do, uh, especially out there. And you know, it's adjacent to the creek. Uh, it, they're, they're usually nicer looking, and and, uh, and they do uh, work with traffic. Uh, but I think what we uh, needs to be done is is a resolution as to the uh, the region with respect to that. Probably looking at all options, which is signals, stop signs. Um, because it's just a single stop right now. It's not an all-way stop, uh, and that might be an interim solution. And then perhaps with a, a view to look at at uh, traffic uh, circle, uh, keeping in mind uh, some pedestrian treatments that will allow safe movement of pedestrians. So something along that lines. Uh, and, and I know in the past when councils asked that, I usually formulate a um, a resolution and I send it off to the traffic person. At, at the region, which is uh, Carolyn Rao, and she's good at responding to these things. Okay. And that's what I'll do, Your Worship. I'll make a resolution that, uh, that or I'll make a motion that we send a resolution on to uh, the region. what are you doing with our garbage? Um, although they don't really know that there's a separation between the city and the region and the region is the one that looks after the contract, we should have a say in what we want. We should have a say in what the baseline level of service is. Um, I mean, it seems like the service can, ever since we uploaded it, continues to dwindle and dwindle, yet the price doesn't dwindle and dwindle. Um, so, I mean, is there an opportunity for the city to take the service back and, and, and you know, do an RFP ourselves, um, have our own contract for garbage collection. This way we can decide what our base level of service is, uh, or are we stuck in it now in the sense that um, because it was uploaded to the region so many years ago that they now have control of garbage collection. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's somewhat frustrating because a number of years ago when we uploaded it, we had, um, we had city workers collecting garbage and we also had city facilities where we dumped garbage and the region used their own facilities. They don't do any of that now. They contract the service out and we don't, and we don't use the regional dumps. So um, it doesn't really seem like, they're, like there's a solution to garbage in the sense that it's just going to be a contract that, that, that's given out. So why don't we do our own contract? 
That would be my question. And my other question is, do we want to actually give input on what our baseline level of service should be? I'm not in favor Jeff, of two-week collection. Sorry, Mayor. In fact, uh, there, there is a resolution from the region, and uh, they've invited us to, to comment on the level of service that is currently being provided. Uh, we can expand it to look at uh, uh, costs of providing the service ourselves, uh, if you wish. Um, they're looking for comments by February of next year, and so um, I was planning to bring this back to the new council. Um, if you'd like to see some of the background information ahead of time, I can certainly share that with you, but um, we're still doing a little bit of research and uh, um, hope to have some, uh, some good information. Yeah, Your Worship, I'm fine with that. I mean, if February is the deadline for comments, then I'm fine with the new council deciding okay. on that. Any other new business? Yeah. Uh, Motion for adjournment before we lose everybody? Yes. Councillor? I just want to comment on the uh, uploading the uh, waste collection uh, to the region. Uh, I, I was around at that time, and I tell you, the costs involved uh, were escalating. <laughs> so much uh, uh, we brought it to council and uh, I was the happiest guy on this council at the time to uh, upload that to the region because it was really killing us with the budget uh, requirements so anyway it would be interesting uh, to have all the information to just see where we stand with that but I recall that very well uh, it was a serious problem financially for the municipality. Motion for adjournment. Meetings adjourned. <laughs>